Please welcome to the stage to bring greetings on behalf of the Honorable Professor Gordon Shirley, CMU Council Chairman, Ms. Cora Ann Robertson Sylvester, member of the CMU Council. Good morning. A big warm CMU welcome to all our visitors and guests and students. I'm bringing greetings from our chair, um, Professor Gordon Shirley, who unavoidably could not be with us this morning. But I'm here with you. I'm a member of the CMU Council, a very proud one, and I want to welcome you all. Professor Andrew Spencer, President of the Caribbean Maritime University and Conference Chair, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett, Minister of Tourism, Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Ambassador Olivier, French Ambassador to Jamaica, Ambassador Joachim, Executive Director of the Center of the Blue Economy and, the, and Innovation, members of the CMU leadership, faculty and staff members, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students, 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 both in this room and joining us in cyberspace, good morning. Let me warmly welcome you to the inaugural staging of the Port Royal Lecture Series. I'm bringing greetings on behalf of Professor Gordon Shirley, council chairman and the council member of the CMU. As a council member, I'm even more excited that this lecture is taking place on the CMU campus, and far more than that, has been developed and launched by the CMU. This is a part of a series of events being undertaken by the CMU to continue to remind Jamaicans and other Caribbean people of the integral role of the maritime and related industries and connected to the central role that the CMU plays in the development of a human capital that underpins this vital sector. The establishment of such an event is a significant moment in maritime history. It speaks to the interests, advancement, and the recognition of the blue economy and its development. How important is the blue economy? What is the blue economy? It's to simply say it's anything from the sea, about the sea, and how we preserve it. So, you know, it's not as complicated as it seems. It's about our life. How important is the blue economy? Well, Consider that one and a half trillion US dollars per year, that's the value of the blue economy, and that's set to double to three billion US by 2030. That means that the sector represents significant opportunities for Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the world. This is one reason I am also excited about the theme for this lecture, the blue economy regeneration and resilience. It underscores the importance of the blue economy for the, for the sustainability of our economy. Traditionally, the blue economy included fisheries, tourism, and maritime transport. However, we now see new and emerging activities such as offshore renewable energy, aquaculture, seabed extra activities, and maritime bi biotechnology. Thus, it is a resource that must be protected and secured because of its vast impact on the global trade and the development of the countries. We're excited to have each guest speaking with us at this lecture. I want to thank each of you for participating. I know with absolute certainty that the discussions will be enriching and as such of what is shared here will be useful and applicable to developing the industry. Each of us will leave with a renewed motivation to find innovative ways of building out the sector to meet its, its existing and upcoming needs. The focal drive of this lecture is to exchange ideas and to have discussion. By participating in this exchange, it is hoped that all parties who may benefit from this, this lecture can apply it to managing activities in their area. I look forward to sharing with you at this lecture and wish for you a successful event. Thank you very much.
As the first ever UWE professor in the field of tourism, a former executive director of the tourism product development company TPDCO, the largest agency in the tourism ministry, and a management professional, or moderator today, CMU President Professor Andrew Spencer, has extensive knowledge of the enormous value and potential hidden in Jamaica's natural gifts. Professor Spencer joined the CMU in September 2022 and has been emphasizing that the university should be at the forefront of developing the blue economy, given its role in educating the professionals who serve the trillion dollar maritime sector. Please make him welcome as he officially launches the CMU Port Royal Lecture Series under the theme, The Blue Economy, Regeneration and Resilience. Good morning, everyone. I was about to speak to you with this earpiece in, but um, I'm going to attempt to go without it for a minute, and I'm, I, I promise the technical people I'll put it back in when I think they need to communicate with me. Uh, today, we are here to bring like-minded people together. Individuals who have an interest in this very important topic in a space such as this. We have a minister who is a global figure of unimaginable repute. He's an expert on tourism, resilience, global affairs, and dare I say, life in general. Life on land and life on the sea. We have another minister who is a champion for the environment and who has key responsibilities for the blue and green economy. He's the embodiment of where responsibility meets passion. We have two distinguished di diplomats who have served their countries as ambassadors, but who get this business better than you and I. They both also serve as permanent representatives to the International Seabed Authority. So ladies and gentlemen, you'll agree with me that we got the who right. We have the right people assembled here. I want to take the time to acknowledge Mrs. Cora Ann Robertson Sylvester, a member of council and a powerhouse CEO of, uh, sh in the shipping business and also a former president of the Caribbean Shipping Association who brought greetings on behalf of Professor Gordon Shirley who is unavoidably absent. Welcome Mrs. Robertson Sylvester. I look around the room and I see all of these distinguished individuals, other diplomats in the room. I see former commissioners of police in the room. I see our CMU leadership, uh, vice presidents and others. I see leadership from the Tourism Product Development Company, well represented. I see the tourism fraternity. I see insurance executives present in the room. I also look around and I see the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association vice president, who is not just the vice president of the JHTA, Mr. Kyle Mays, but who is also the head of environmental affairs for the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association, well placed in this forum. And also he is the head of CAST, which is the Alliance, the Caribbean Alliance for Sustainable Tourism, which is also a part of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourist Association. Let's make Mr. Mays welcome. I see beside Mr. Mays, Mrs. Carolyn McDonald Riley, who is the director of the Tourism Linkages Network, and beside her, and beside her, I see Ms. Carol Rose Brown, who is the director of the Jamaica Center for Tourism Innovation, and beside her, I see Mr. Darren Lawrence, who is managing director of ILDS, and those of you in the room who don't know who that is, and if you're a student, you need to find that out because that means employment. I see many distinguished individuals, and if I don't call your name, please forgive me today. But ladies and gentlemen, as wide as the oceans are, so vast are the opportunities they present for us. We are surrounded by these oceans in the Caribbean, but we take them for granted. So if you think about it, despite being surrounded by the Caribbean Sea, Jamaica really isn't utilizing its marine resources in an optimal way. We occupy a relatively small landmass, and you'll hear more about that from the presenters. But the truth is that our ocean mass surrounding our spaces 
are far more vast than the land mass. We're talking about something that focuses on over 80% of all travel or all trade to the region happening on the seas. We're talking about a space where we're producing individuals who are looking at ports and who are looking at logistics and the fluidity of all that takes place. We're talking about an economy, the blue economy, that provides for us in significant ways, many of which many of us don't understand. And it is also the basis, ladies and gentlemen, for the tourism model of Jamaica, which is heavily based on coastal tourism. So you will see also that we got the what right. We got the who right. We have the right people in the room. We got the what spot on. We are at Jamaica's only specialized public university and the Caribbean's only maritime university with a talented team of 340 strong and an average student count of 3,000 and tens of thousands of graduates from an institution that controls the production of the human capital for the movement of goods for trade by sea and for the management of ports, border security, and applied engineering solutions through the best technology available in the region. So we definitely hit a note of perfection with the where. We are at the Caribbean Maritime University. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this magnificent campus and say to you that by being here, you're helping us to re recognize our mission of redefining maritime excellence through innovation, research, and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, my job before I get into the enormous task of introducing Minister Bartlett is to do a little context setting for you. And so I'll ask that you queue up so we can go with our discussion. So, very quickly, we talked about what the blue economy is, ladies and gentlemen, and we're looking at some very important statistics. We're talking about a worldwide ocean economy of $1.5 trillion per year with potential to earn $24 trillion because of the value of those assets. And also we have to think about the fact that it is the seventh largest economy in the world. We're talking about potential for job creation. Many of you in this room are keen on getting jobs on completion. And I didn't take the time to big up the students in the room. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to give them a round of applause as well. And there's an opportunity for the blue economy to contribute to development in a number of ways, through poverty eradication, uh, through mitigating climate change if we manage carefully among other things. Just to give you a little sense, I mentioned that over 80% of global trade happens by sea, and you would imagine that in the Caribbean in particular, where we don't have large land masses, a lot of what happens for us happens by sea, not only in terms of trade. We're looking at jobs, we're looking at the, 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 the oil production that comes offshore, we're looking also at feeding our population. We're looking at food security. And I want to take the opportunity to welcome Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister with Responsibility for the Blue and the Green Economy and Water and many other things. Let's make him welcome. Round of applause. And so it's very important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to take a very empirical evidence-based approach to what we do and so today we're going to be having discussions about how oceanogra oceanographic data helps in terms of how we're able to manage resources carefully and we're looking forward to that particular speaker we're also talking about the fact that oceanographic data helps with not just our ability to unearth value and to extract value, but also our ability to protect the space that creates this value. And so the protection of the marine environment becomes particularly critical. Now, tourism. Anybody who knows me knows that essentially I am the tourism guy, whether I want to own it or not. I see Minister Bartlett doing this. At a, at a conference recently, he made a statement that people come to him as doctors and leave him as professors. 
And he used me as one of those examples. And I'm happy to say that having passed through that ministry, I, I was able to emerge as the, the university's first professor of tourism at the time. But tourism, ladies and gentlemen, is, is an important part of the discussion. And so we could not have a better keynote speaker today. You're talking about a, an industry with enormous potential. And the fact that that industry interacts in the way that it does with the blue economy is also an important part of the discussion. You're talking about dive tourism, recreational fishing, and so on. But the one we talk about least in terms of the extraction of value is cruise tourism. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that from Minister Bartlett a little later on. So this is an important visual for you. Look at the landmass of Jamaica. Look at the area surrounding the landmass for which we have jurisdiction. It's easily many times larger than the landmass itself. We have not yet begun to scratch the surface in terms of understanding how we're able to tap into the potential of the value surrounding our land. And that's an in, a part of the discussion that will happen today. So back to the argument of trade, we're looking at 80% by volume. 70% by value according to the International Maritime Organization. We're looking at the fact that by 2030, we're expecting that trade via ocean is expected to double. And we're talking about the fact that trade via ocean is expected to quadruple by 2050. These are important things for us to bear in mind. Fisheries, I will not get too deep in because I know Minister Samuda may have something to say about that. And in fact, our second in the series for the Port Royal Lecture Series is likely to look at open sea farming. But just to pick out one of these important bits, that food from the sea, the last bubble, food from the sea is a primary source of protein to 50% of populations in least developed countries. And that's an important bit of data for you because we're talking about the potential for development. The Caribbean region, of course, we have some challenges. And the blue economy can help us to address some of these challenges very aggressively. Unemployment, food shortages, poverty as a major one that I know you see around you daily. And of course, climate change and potential for renewable energy sources. As I wrap up, I want to just share this with you. If you think about how we manage the sustainability of our resources, there needs to be a particular approach taken. First, we need strategic frameworks to guide us. We need to action the strategies and the, and, the, and the initiatives. We need not suffer from the implementation deficit. And of course, we must engage all stakeholders. We have started to do that today by engaging your minds to understanding what really needs to happen. So we need to create a knowledge hub, and that's what we're doing. Number one on this slide is what we're doing today, ladies and gentlemen. We're establishing the CMU as the knowledge hub for the blue economy. And I think you ought to give us a round of applause for that because there could be no better location for our knowledge hub. We also need to provide the resources to coordinate, guide, and inform government actions. And we have government representation today, so that's fantastic. We need to formulate and implement coastal and marine spatial plans. We need to ensure that we include women. And I want to pause here just to say that our group of speakers today is very testosterone driven but that was not deliberate outside of the fact that what we wanted to hear today comes best from these individuals here present look out for future events in this series where we're going to have that female representation but more importantly than the female representation in speakers is that we are going to include topics that relate to the treatment of females and and, and gender issues and of course we have to support our msmes and our entrepreneurs and ensure that there's access to financial resources. We're doing some things, and that's what this slide says. But we're doing it in quite a fragmented way. What we want is a more coordinated, congealed approach throughout the region. So you're seeing pockets of individuals attacking issues of blue economy, but we need to have more of a coordinated approach. Climate change, Minister Samuda will talk much more about that. But the two things in blue are what I want to bring to your attention. The ocean holds 50, more than 50% of the carbon dioxide in liquid or solid form. That's important. But it's also a source of oxygen for humans. 
And many times we think about the spaces that we occupy and we don't think about how ecosystems work. And when we throw something in the ocean and we see all the plastic bottles coming up to the shore while we drive on the Palisados, we're affecting the ability of the ocean to do what it must do seamlessly. Renewable energy, we'll have a discussion on that later on by one of the ambassadors. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me, I could go on for a very long time because I'm very passionate about what we're doing. But I understand that every single individual who is a speaker for us today has a very tight schedule. And I, and I want the ministers, after they speak, I want to grab them for a little moment to have them sit with us and engage in a few questions from you. So I'm going to invite them to speak very shortly. But I wanted to just say in closing that if we are to be true to SDG 14, life below water, then we must take these discussions seriously. We must take our approach very seriously. We must come up with tangible actions and we must make things happen in a very aggressive way, understanding that we've already lost time. And there's an urgency of now in ensuring that we fully capitalize. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to me. And I, I, I won't ask you to give me a round of applause, but I'm sure you will nonetheless. <laughs> and at this moment, I cannot bring on who Terry Carell calls the world boss minister or the swag boss minister or the, the gentleman who won the award for. He got minister of the Caribbean. He got minister of the world. He's now in the, the hall of fame. Um, for, for, for tourism, he is now many things, and we, we joked about it that he's probably Minister of Tourism for the universe too, right? But before I bring him on, we want to tantalize your appetites by making his entrance a powerful one. And so we're going to invite for a little bit of excitement now while we have an item. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sashana Davey, student of the Creative Arts Center at the Caribbean Maritime University. thousand spotlights all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough never be enough towers of gold are still too little these hands could hold the world but it'll never be enough never be enough
Ladies and gentlemen, Sashana Davy. Please welcome back Professor Andrew Spencer. Another round of applause, please. <laughs> Fabulous talent and very emblematic of what the CMU represents. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you at this moment a distinguished public servant. For over four decades, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett was first appointed Minister of Tourism in 2007, serving until 2011. Prior to this, he already had a solid record of accomplishment as an outstanding legislator in central government in both chambers of parliament. He served as Minister of State for Information, Broadcasting and Culture in the office of the Prime Minister and Minister of Youth, Sports and Community Development from 1980 to 1989. Later, he served as Senator and Opposition Spokesman on various portfolios, including tourism from 1989 to 2007. We're delighted to have Minister Bartlett with us as he's passionate about the health and sustainability of our oceans, especially given its impact on Jamaica's tourism industry. And I want to tell you that on this weekend, he's going off to Berlin to be awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award for Sustainable Tourism by the Pacific Area Writers. Let's give him a round of applause. He also understands well the challenge of balancing economic gains while conserving Jamaica's marine wildlife through a sustainable tourism economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me make welcome the one and only, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett, Minister of Tourism. I think Professor Spencer has forgotten that he's no longer in my employ. <laughs> uh, I, I really want to begin by paying tribute to him because I think he's probably one of the youngest professors in the Caribbean today. And he achieved that distinction <laughs> and he achieved that distinction not because he is the tanned and handsome fellow that he is, which is true, but he received that distinction because of hard work, commitment, assiduity to duty, and most importantly, a level of intellectual rigor that is befitting a true professor with a great future. We are excited about it. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, or Ambassador, representing their country in the Law of the Sea Convention here in Jamaica, my minister colleague and um, one of my protégés, um, Minister Matthew Samuda, distinguished faculty members of this great university, and I say that with great pride, because I recall very well <clears throat> when you started, and I've watched you with great interest and pride as you grew and became, in fact, not just a university of reference in the Caribbean, but an important addition to the academic landscape, not just of the Caribbean, but the world. We're excited about what you've been doing, the quality of the graduates that you have uh, made, and we think that uh, education and knowledge and information and, are not good enough if they're not converted into meaningful, practical, value-added applications. And that's what you do here at the university. So you don't graduate until you have shown that you have the ability to convert 
that information, knowledge you got here, into practical application, which has a value and no doubt a price. So I'm excited about where the future is going for us. And particularly, I want to commend Professor Andrew Spencer for this innovation, the Port Royal Lecture Series. This is a product, and I want you to own it, and then to make it available to the world. Because I could see, like we have tried to do with resilience, the world coming to Jamaica, not just to celebrate, but also to celebrate on the important issues relating to sustainable development as it relates to the maritime assets. Bearing in mind that our economic zone is 25 times the size of our island of Jamaica. And we sit in an ocean that is also regarded um, a Caribbean Sea, that is um, one of the largest bodies of water in the oceans of the world. And so there's so much that we can do as a result of this special geological positioning where we sit in the beautiful, wonderful Caribbean Sea, which is so valuable. <clears throat> You've asked me to keynote this very prestigious lecture series today, and um, I'm not sure of my own competence to do it, but I've tried to look at how I can put together a few thoughts and ideas that may be helpful just may be helpful in enabling you to broaden this scope of your own appreciation, A, of the blue economy, but B, of your role, because sustainability is not the preserve of an institution or even a nation. It's the responsibility of everyone, each one. And it's only when we understand that we have a responsibility and we discharge that responsibility with alacrity and with competence that we will not only survive ourselves, but secure the survival of the future. So the World Bank defines the blue economy as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean ecosystem health. And that's the definition that I borrow. It's not mine, but it's adequate. This definition imposes moral responsibility on all industries, especially those that significantly harness or exploit ocean and marine resources in their value chain to make greater efforts to protect fragile and gradually depleting ocean and marine systems that have become increasingly susceptible to man-made phenomena. These, of course, include ocean pollution, shipping and transport, dredging, offshore drilling, deep sea mining, overfishing, and the degradation of coastal and marine ecosystems linked to sea level rise that we commonly call global warming. Admittedly, tourism-related activities impose significant stress on coastal and marine ecosystems. Thus, the sector must commensurately play a leading global role in adopting and encouraging more sustainable values, attitudes, and practices that will promote healthy ocean and marine ecosystems in the long run. The role of the tourism sector in promoting ocean health has already been officially recognized in the Sustainable Development Goals, commonly SDGs, SGDs. Uh, by way, of course, and Professor uh, Andrew mentioned it, by way of SGD 14, which emphasizes the sector's role 
in the sustainable use of oceans and marine resources. To ensure that the tourism industry plays its part in contributing to ocean sustainability, there needs to be uh, what I call a seriousness of intent, purpose, and action among us, the tourism stakeholders, at all levels to address industrial action that harm ocean and marine resources. Such firm commitment to sustainable behavior and practices is necessary, I think, to help preserve the enormous benefits that healthy marine and coastal ecosystems to the economic livelihood and survival of billions of people globally. Indeed, the oceans cover some 70% of the planet, and it provides us with oxygen and food. It regulates the climate as well as it provides habitat for 80% of life on Earth. Overall, then, healthy marine coastal ecosystems serve as valuable sources of food, income, trade and shipping, minerals, energy, water supply, recreation, and indeed tourism. The importance of healthy marine and coastal system then in promoting sustainable tourism is especially worthy, I think, of acknowledgement. This is against the background that based on figures from the United Nations Global Compact, some 80% of tourism occurs along coastal towns and areas while the ocean-related tourism industry grows at an estimated 134 billion US dollars per year. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, has also predicted that marine and coastal tourism will be the largest sector of the global ocean-based economy by 2030, generating some 777 billion U.S. dollars in global revenue and employing 8.6 million people. And small island states such as ours are particular, um, in fact, dependent and reliant on coastal and marine tourism. And just for information to our students that we in the Caribbean are the most tourism dependent region on earth. And I'll have a few numbers for you in a short while. It constitutes, in fact, the largest economic sector for the small and island developing states, commonly called SIDS, and also many coastal states, including, of course, in the United States and some of the larger countries of the world that are bathed by oceans. In the Caribbean, for example, the industry accounts for a quarter of the total economy. I say that again. In the Caribbean, the industry accounts for a quarter of the total economy. A fifth, one fifth, 20% of all the jobs. And the 2016 study by the World Bank estimated that the economic value of the Caribbean Sea coastal and marine ecosystem is 54.55 billion US dollars. Indeed, the Caribbean Sea, which encircles the Caribbean region and is the second largest region of the Atlantic Ocean, and I want to say that again, because I made reference earlier to the fact that the Caribbean Sea is such an important body of water within the oceans of the world. Indeed, the Caribbean Sea, which encircles the Caribbean region, <clears throat> is in fact the second largest region of the Atlantic Ocean. It is a valuable source of food, as you know, income, trade and shipping, minerals, energy, water supply, recreation and tourism for all of us in this Caribbean area. 
The coral reef, mangrove, seagrass complex also brings increased safety to coastal communities as the systems act as a natural barrier, decreasing the impact of floods and storms. And we are very aware of that because we are in an area with uh, climate events. We, we don't talk of disasters in tourism. We don't have disasters in tourism. We have events. So, so you know, we would have seismic events and weather events and climatic events and so on. The Caribbean Sea is considered the high diversity heart of the tropical West Atlantic. And without coral reefs, it has been estimated that 25% of all marine life would die. Unfortunately, marine and coastal ecosystems are often threatened by tourism development. The areas that attract tourists have been coming under increasing pressure from the damage and pollution caused by tourist facilities and the supporting infrastructure. And that leads me to make the point that the responsibility of tourism becomes crucial in terms of its own longevity unless it understands its stewardship of the environment and the marine ecosystems. So at the same time, the impact of climate change, overfishing, and other unsustainable practices, and even some marine tourism activities also damage marine ecosystems, such as coral reefs, that are vital for maintaining ecological diversity and regulating climate. The United Nations has estimated the cost of reduced tourism due to coral bleaching at 12 billion annually. That makes the point that the future of tourism is predicated on its stewardship of the environment and the ecosystems. The transition to sustainable ocean economies will ultimately require a set of concrete ideas, strategies, toolkits, best practices, and policies that can be standardized and operationalized by all tourism stakeholders working in collaboration with policymakers, regulators, and all other interest groups and stakeholders that are committed to ocean action. The ultimate goal here is to ensure that coastal and ocean-based tourism is sustainable, resilient, addresses climate change, reduces pollution, supports ecosystem regeneration and biodiversity conservation, and also invests in local jobs and communities. And I think it's a little mouthful there, students, but it makes the point in terms of that balance of responsibility with economic objectives. You can't go without each other. It's like horse and carriage. It goes together. So social responsibility for community goes hand in hand with economic development and prosperity. So resilience then is an especially important concept in the context of the blue economy. It refers to the ability of a system, community, individual, or resource to adapt and recover from stress, shock, or disruption. But I want to add a little bit because resilience is not just about bouncing back or even bouncing back quickly. It's also about thriving after you have bounced back. And to enable resilience, there are five critical steps that you need to follow. One, first, you, you need to be able to predict the disruptions. So you need the capacity for observatory activity so you can track disruptions. Secondly, you need the capacity to mitigate 
In other words, to try to prevent the disruption. And thirdly, you need to be able to manage the disruptions when they come. And fourthly, you need to recover and recover quickly. And then fifth, to thrive after recovery. Recognizing those as what I call the, the five pillars of resilience. It requires training, it requires knowledge, information, application, and it requires a careful appreciation of one key element called communication. To be able to communicate effectively, accurately, credibly, and also with a credible voice, staying on message is vital also to securing, in the final analysis, a truly resilient activity. So as we acknowledge, marine ecosystems are under pressure from various activities, including overfishing, as I mentioned before, pollution, climate change, ecosystem degradation, and habitat destruction. These stressors can have significant economic, social, and environmental impacts affecting the livelihood of millions of people around the world. Resilience is therefore essential to ensuring the long-term sustainability of ocean resources and the communities that depend on them. While tourism is a key sector of the blue economy, providing economic opportunities for coastal communities and promoting the conservation of marine ecosystems, the industry can also have a negative impact on the environment and the communities it serves, especially areas where resources are limited. And you know, an example of this impact associated, I think, with large cruise ships and the emissions from these ships that come into our area. The impact on, you know, from greenhouse gases, uh, which we think contribute so much to climate change and the waste from ships. And this is something that we have to be careful about. And I think every country that does, in fact, engage with cruise shipping has to develop the capacity to manage these discharges that are part of the process. The ships don't sail unless they emit. So how do we manage that? How do we make sure that these emissions are not destructive to the marine ecosystem, which is a livelihood of millions of people and where countries such as small island developing states, SIDS as we call them, are so vulnerable. So we have to look at how to ensure that the use of the marine assets are not destructive to the future development of the countries that are in the, <laughs> the, 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 the direct object of our economic engagements. And, and this is a big area of discussion that we have to um, engage with. We have to bring the big partners together. We have to bring our cruise lines into the discussion. We have to also look at certain other types of marine tourism activities such as yachting, um, kayaking, uh, you know, uh, scuba diving, and all these other activities which are critical for economic returns but also can have um, a deleterious impact on the ecosystem. So indeed, tourism stakeholders must play their part to promote a sustainable blue economy through awareness raising, behavioral modifications, identifying gaps, as well as innovative and scalable solutions. Tourism development in the SIDS and the coastal regions should take into account the potential impact of climate change and global warming and adapt and implement adequate disaster risk reduction policies and practices in order 
to increase the resilience of the tourism sector. So greater attention also needs to be placed on the development of standards for environmental compliance through the tourism value chain and systems for monitoring and enforcement. The cruise industry in particular needs to continue to accelerate gains in four key areas, controlling emissions, sewage treatment, fuel efficiency, and recycling to reduce its environmental impact. I should repeat that because that's critical. So we say greater attention also needs to be placed on the development of standards for environmental compliance throughout the tourism value chain and systems for monitoring and enforcement. The cruise industry in particular needs to continue to accelerate gains in four key areas. One, controlling emissions. Two, sewage treatment. Three, fuel efficiencies. And finally, recycling to reduce environmental impact. Overall, then, the blue economy approach recognizes and places renewed emphasis on the critical need for the international community to, to address effectively the second management of resources, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the sound management of resources in and beneath international waters by the further development and refinement of international laws and ocean governance mechanisms. And I think our friends from the, the um, law of the sea, the, the, the seabed authority here would have something to say to us on that, no doubt, later on, because the establishment of these laws and regulations are critical, but the more important element of it is to build strong governance in these areas. So it is my view that a blue economy approach where ecosystem services are properly valued and incorporated into development planning will further advance the transition of the tourism industry, guiding tourism development and promoting lower impact activities such as ecotourism, nature-based tourism, where in my mind, the natural capital is maintained as an integral part of the process. So finally, efficiency and optimization of resource use are paramount whilst respecting environmental and ecological parameters. This is very important. And I think students need to bear that in mind. This includes, of course, where sustainable, we do the sourcing of local materials and utilize, where feasible, blue low energy options to realize efficiencies and benefits. And I'm just going to repeat that little bit because that's a charge. That efficiency and optimization of resources used by us in generating our own well-being and developing our own systems for economic growth and prosperity that we must include in all of this local raw materials as much as possible and to use low energy options in order to realize the efficiencies and the full benefit of development for all. This lecture series has great potential to bring together some of the best minds to offer the greatest insight into ways and systems, procedures and practices laws and regulatory arrangements as well as institutional framework 
that will enable us to not only secure today, but to future-proof planet Earth. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for Minister Bartlett. Now, I, I, I'm going to use Chairman's privileges to, to tweak our program a little bit because Minister Bartlett has to leave us in a short while, but I didn't want him to go without you having the opportunity to ask him a few questions or make a few comments to which you would want his reactions. Uh, how we will do this is that Minister Bartlett will, will join me at the podium, and uh, we're going to allow not very many. If there are three or so questions that you have that you wanted to ask, there are roving microphones. You'll just indicate by raising your hand, and a microphone will be brought to you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for that. But I have one question for Minister to begin this segment. Uh, Minister, I wondered what your thought process was on. You mentioned the issue of the stewardship being important for the longevity of multiple industries, but in particular tourism. What is your sense about the disposition of the Caribbean as a region towards this notion of protecting the natural capital? Well, you know, we begin on the basis of the bane of our lives is ignorance. Our future development is knowledge. And so the biggest problem in the Caribbean is that we don't know enough about this blue capital that we have around us. And we seem not to have the will or the ambition to get that knowledge and information. Because the curriculum of our schools are not sufficiently imbued with items relating to environmental management and particularly the blue capital. The fact is that it could be that it is a, a recent realization that having been in this great Caribbean Sea for centuries, millennials maybe, the realization is just dawning on us that we can really be wealthy, be powerful, be strong, be fully uh, prosperous as a result of this blue capital. And I think that um, the CMU has a leadership in this area. And I think we are well positioned to give the guidance and to change the game in our Caribbean space in terms of more information, more knowledge, and better application of that knowledge to enabling the strengthening of the blue capital. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. I see the students writing feverishly. And I, I know I have a tendency to hog the floor because I have so many questions for you when I catch you like this, but I know that there are others who have questions. Are the microphones moving around? I see a student's hand right here uh, to the front. You may just stand so that they can reach to you with the microphone. Um, yeah, morning. Morning, Minister Bartlett. Um, so as a tourism student, um, we are not ignorant to the blue economy. Um, and the impact that the tourism industry has um, in general. However, we live in a very traditional society where ignorance is the order of the day, especially with things that are new. I know you mentioned a lot about resilience, but how can we ensure that effective and efficient means and methods like this Port Royal series are introduced into society to ensure that persons understand fully the impact of tourism or the impact of resilience on regenerative and sustainable tourism and its development and contribution to the blue economy. Right. So, 
So, so you've asked the question that comes straight back into my space, right? Because it is our responsibility to develop the capacity now to mine data, to do analytic work, and to produce outcomes that you can utilize to remove that, what I call, veil of ignorance that seem to be over us in general as a country. So, Minister Samuda has a responsibility at another side of government to help to create the institutional capacity and to bring laws and regulations to enable compliance. And then here at the university, we have the responsibility to create the data, the information that will now advise policies that have to be made. So the business of removing that ignorance is now bigger than me. It becomes all of us, but it also rests solidly in those institutional arrangements that we have that have the capability so to do. And they are the educational institutions to begin with. And then the public education activities, communication. And in our case in Jamaica, the GIS is one arm of it. Um, then you have the media that is so strong and powerful. And the media has a huge responsibility in this regard, has been the crucible through which the data, information, ideas are transmitted daily. And then, of course, we have other players like artists and musicians and cultural specialists who have influence as some of the great purveyors of ideas and the influencers. And now in the social media, we get into another whole space and um, a possibility for more and more people, bloggers and all sorts of other influencers and people who peddle ideas. So the whole business of removing this pale of ignorance is a total one which involves all of us. But center to it must be governments. So Minister Samud and I take responsibility to start with. All right? And you smile when we say that. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we, we just have time for one more, if there is one. I see, oh, I see, uh, I, I start by saying he's a great Wolmerian, but I will say that he's also a, a senior retired military man so i wanted to and maritime as well so i wanted to invite uh, as head of the coast guard thank you minister uh john mcfarlane who has a question for the minister uh this is not a question minister it's really just to thank you for a statement you made one of my past lives was with the with um, the office then of disaster preparedness and emergency and we changed the name, I was influential, getting the name changed to emergency management. And the, I would like you to perhaps um, trademark, copyright, your event component. <laughs> because the truth is, if we recognize that all these are events, it's a seismic event, it's a weather event, we can mitigate and sometimes eliminate it becoming a disaster. Disasters are consequences, they're not the event. And I want to thank you for that, sir, and to encourage you to sell it a lot more. Thank you, thank you. Five minutes, right? All right. Uh, five minutes more. So, so Minister, yeah, we'll just five minutes more, which is good because I know I have colleagues in the room like Dr. Andrea Clayton and Myrna Ellis who, who always have an interest in things such as these and who may have questions, but I see a student's hand. Student. So I'll take the student um, before I allow either of the individuals to go. Hi, good day. Um, all protocols are respected. 
Uh, Minister, I'm one of the beneficiaries of your innovator incubators, right? Ah, cool. Um, so, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the main things is to create technological tools that can benefit the students here as well. Um, but what I would like to know, because you have a high level view of tourism, what, how do you see the future of tourism in the next 10 years? Again, you have a high level view you know, what, what's, what's your vision for Jama brand Jamaica? All right, good. Now, I, I want to begin by giving a definition for tourism, which is critical, I think, for a better understanding of what it is. Because people think tourism is an, is an end or that tourism is an activity, that tourism is really an industry, in the classical sense of an industry. No, tourism really is a confluence of a series of activities and events and social activities, economic activities, without which an experience is not made. So perhaps I should define it in a straight way for you without negatives. So say tourism is a confluence of ideas, actions, economic, social, which must all come together seamlessly to create an experience that people consume. So tourism doesn't exist unto itself. So tourism has no future. What has future are people with ideas. And with ideas, they create products and experiences and people travel all across the world to consume those experiences. So the future for us then is to diversify our economy to the nth degree. The future is for us to innovate, 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 innovate because people travel to fulfill their passions. It's the only reason they travel. What are these passions? Well, name it. So this is one area that everybody can be wealthy, everybody can be prosperous as a result of their involvement because it does not define you in order to utilize you. You are who you are very special, very unique, with ideas that can generate products and services that people travel all over the world to, do, to buy, and to pay for. And the reason that we've established the Innovation Incubator, and I'm happy that you are living testimony of that, is to advance that very process of ideas mining and ideas building and then to incentivize ideas. We put up $40 million in that budget to support ideas. And I'm adding 100 million more this year, this budget year, in order to do the transition now from ideas to material outcomes. And that's how tourism will be future-proofed and 10 years time, we will be stronger, bigger, and better because there will be more reasons for more people to visit Jamaica. Right. Thank you so much, Minister. And Dr. Clayton does have a question. I knew it. And I would like to, one minute, I'll ask her to make it succinct. And I know Minister will do the same in his response. Over to you, Doc. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Minister. This is actually a statement, and it's in response to some of the questions that were asked. Um, we, we tend to overlook, particularly when we're talking to the average person on the road, on the street, in Jamaica, average citizen, we sometimes overlook the importance of generational knowledge in building resilience, and also as a tool in addressing ignorance. And so I want to encourage us to consider that as a method in our strategic plan. Yes. Yes. You know, you know I, I, I applaud that because
the power of oral tradition must never be overlooked because the wisdom does not reside in the center anymore. It's now everywhere. And your parents and your grandparents from that generation who have shown resilience, they were able to bounce back from many disruptions. How did they do it? So you learn from the past not to repeat the mistakes of the past, but to guide a future action that always add value. And I want to leave you with that. As students, you are here for one purpose on earth, and that is to add value. Thank you. Minister, I thank you. I, I, I see that, Minister, I know you're on your way out, and I, I had called out Myrna Ellis recently, Minister. Minister Bartlett, I see that Myrna Ellis is waving her microphone at the back. I think she just wants that one last bit of you. Um, Lady Ellis, you're going to make this one quick. Hi, good. good morning, everyone. So, Minister Bartlett, I have a challenge as a lecturer in tourism. So, recently, coming out of your Global Tourism Resilience Conference, I found out in, in more ways than one that my students, and they had said this to me when they came to me um, in the early stages of their studies, that they were discouraged from coming into the tourism industry. He said, Miss, many of us went against the recommendations of our parents and our guardians. At the conference, some students said that their parents told them they won't fund them if they were coming into tourism. Now, Mr. Van der Poel from Bahamas has said on many occasions, if a country is dependent on a particular industry, then what you want are the best minds, the brightest, the most talented citizenry in that industry. But when you have persons discouraging those minds from coming into tourism in a country like Jamaica, then to me that's an oxymoron. So I'm asking you, Minister, what would be your initial um, take on how this can be turned around? Because we know that part of resilience has to do with competency in the workforce, and that starts in education. Thank you. Almost answered the question. <laughs> because that last word that you use, education, really says it all. But I think the reason people have been encouraged away from tourism, yeah, is the ignorance of what tourism really is. Because they define tourism as the accommodation subsector. So they see it as hotels, and restaurants, but mainly hotels. And for them, hotel means bartenders and, you know, housekeepers. And, and they see a word service, and they look at a bigger word called servitude. And then they get all flustered and confused and say, oh, absolutely not. Not my child. My child must not go to wash dishes for people and to clean floor for people. And so, no, no, I can never train. But that's not tourism. And the future of tourism is now going to be driven by the Internet of Things. The whole area of creating experiences is what tourism is about because that's why people travel 
And tourism is the most consumption dependent industry in the world. We say the propensity to consume in tourism is the highest. A tourist consumes five times the level of a regular citizen. They eat the best food, they drive the best cars, they live in the best accommodation. Everything that they do is at premium and they pay premium prices. So for us, and I'm pushing that now, um, Madam Doctor, yes? If you notice what we have been doing in tourism in Jamaica now, is that you are not hearing us talking much about accommodation and any significant element. Of it. We are talking about now how to build capacity overall to have two things in the industry. One, merit as the basis of your activities in the workforce and two, equity. And merit means building capacity for competence, certification, qualification. So one of the first things I did was to establish the Jamaica Center for Tourism Innovation that Professor uh, Andrew here was chairman of and still will be chairman of it. And we link with the American Hotel and Lodging Institute and the American Culinary Foundation. And now I'm just doing a connection with the University of Malaga to enable us to do two things. One, to qualify you, to give you stackable credentials. And once you're qualified, then we can classify you. And once you're classified, then you can be remunerated according to your classification. And suddenly tourism is really now a career path. Yes? And you have a line of mobility. So you can be a grade one chef, and a grade one chef is this. A grade two um, housekeeper is that. And then beyond that now, you are gone into creating new products yourself. And I'm closing because if I don't, we will continue all morning. That there are two elements to tourism, like the normal economic discussions tell us, demand and supply. The demand side, we are strong and we bring the visitors in. That's great. That's the demand. The supply side is providing what this visitor needs. And that's one of the things we're driving you with the in Innovation Incubator to do. Get on the supply side. And you can be wealthy overnight because the tourism is a voracious feeder. <laughs> that's all they do. They travel to eat and drink. 42% of the expenses that the tourism is on food. And that's tourism. So what we have to do is to redefine tourism, not just by words, but by the kind of program and activities that we indulge in. Training, 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 building capacity, and taking responsibility for the supply side as well as the demand side of tourism. More investment by us on the supply side. And you'll be shocked to know, and I'm closing with this one, because it's a very basic example of how tourism can make anybody wealthy. You don't have to be even a graduate of anything. You just need to have one foolish idea. Like making two crabs race. Have you ever thought about that? Two crabs race and people make money. Lots of money in tourism. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Big, big round of applause for Minister Bartlett, who does it like only he can. And he, he made a swipe at me to say, you know, I don't work for him anymore, so I don't have to keep saying these things. So the fact that I don't work for him anymore and I still say it means you know I mean it, right? 
Wasn't it some wonderful food for thought, ladies and gentlemen? Excellence. And, uh, I mean, just in response to Lady Myrna's point, I don't know if she knew this, but on the point about being discouraged to enter a particular industry, my parents discouraged me from entering tourism. And not everybody is, is as rebellious as I am. I went ahead and did one degree, then a master's degree in tourism, then a PhD in tourism. So don't tell me I can't do something. And I think it kind of worked out. <laughs> So I think we, we really just need to educate our people and, and counter the ignorance surrounding what the industry represents. I want to pause at this moment to welcome a good friend of mine, Executive Director of the Tourism Enhancement Fund, Dr. Kerry Wallace, right here. Let's make him welcome. And if I tell you, if you didn't know and I tell you he controls the money in tourism, you might give him a bigger round of applause. But there may be some partnerships there, right? So at this moment, ladies and gentlemen, we were happy to engage Minister Bartlett in this way, but we do have our program to continue with, and how we will flow is, I will invite the other speakers, I will introduce one at a time, but at the end of it, we will join the platform for a few questions and answers as we sit together. So our next speaker... is Ambassador Smillen, who is a part of the CMU team. Ambassador Smillen joined the Caribbean Maritime University in September 2018 as Vice President of Global Affairs and Executive Director of the Center for the Blue Economy and Innovation. Ambassador, Ambassador Smillen's primary objective is to educate and inform Jamaica and the region about the responsibilities of the blue economy for growth, job creation, and sustainable use of maritime resources through effective research and innovation. Ambassador Schmillen, a former German ambassador to Jamaica, was appointed the permanent representative to the International Seabed Authority in August 2014. Prior to taking up his position as ambassador of Germany to Jamaica, he held many important assignments both in the diplomatic service as well as in the military service in his home country. In 2003, he was posted to Chile as German's, Germany's ambassador and then went on to occupy positions in Nigeria and Peru. We look forward to his presentation, which is entitled Oceanographic Data for, and I correct this, Marine Sustainability. Let's make Ambassador welcome. Thank you so much for the kind words and thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this very important event. Now testing. Okay. Can there be a better time for this first significant event of the Port Royal Lectures? Hardly. What we are talking about today is also the subject of negotiations in New York. A new agreement for protecting the high seas is currently being negotiated there. The ocean is the largest habitat on Earth, which is still almost entirely unexplored. According to calculations of the American National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, only just under 20% of the ocean is mapped. In 1982, this common heritage of humanity was subordinated to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UN Clause. A seabed authority was created here in Kingston to regulate access to raw, material, uh, raw mineral materials. Now, marine life is also to be protected with rules and regulated access. The process is called BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. That is one of the most complex international law negotiations ever, among other things because we don't know exactly what we are negotiating about. After all, 90% of the animated sphere 
is located here in the ocean with millions of unknown species, the largest genetic resource on planet Earth. It is also to be expected that we will still be able to learn many vital biotechnologies from marine organisms. For example, they have tricks to get older than li other lives. They can live with less energy in symbiosis with other organisms. The added value already includes various bioactive sub substances important in cancer medicine or as a substitute for antibiotics against cell aging. We are in the beginning, at the beginning of this research. We have even yet researched a small promil of the habitat. Therefore, the slogan for my presentation today is the information is out there if we only could reach it. I would like to start with an example that will show how much we use daily oceanographic data in our life. I would like to demonstrate that with the Windy app, which runs on an iPhone, Android, or any web browser. You may wonder why I'm using something primarily used for weather forecast to show the importance of oceanographic data. Data collection and data analysis are one of the foundations for research in atmospheric and oceanographic science. An example like Windy or competitor is applied science which we can use daily without thinking much about the data collection. All of this data is the basis for graphical interpretation of the possible development of weather in the next hours and days. The slides you can see here are from last Sunday. I'm forecasting the weather for Kingston. You see here the satellite coverage of the region. You see the wind speed and the waves. The Windy app is offering more than 100 different features you can select. Why observe the ocean and collect oceanographic data? The ocean covers 71% of the surface of our planet. We increasingly recognize how much we rely on it to support human life and our economic, cultural, social and environmental well-being. Ocean observing and collecting oceanographic data is essential for a better understanding of how society and life on Earth are affected by ocean conditions. In addition, the information gathered is invaluable to policymakers, guiding them to make a change at the global, regional and local level. Ocean observing and collecting oceanographic data is essential for weather forecasting and early warning of hazards like tsunamis, storm surges, and extreme waves, and it helps to save lives. All our knowledge of today about ocean warming, ocean acidification, ocean deoxygenation, nutrient pollution, and biodiversity loss is only possible with ocean observing and collecting oceanographic data. The ocean has vast resources for humans. It supplies food, medicine, jobs in fisheries, the transportation of goods, services, tourism, and recreation. All of, these, all of these industries are more efficient if they can predict ocean processes. For example, it doesn't make sense to go fishing in an area if your target fish are not there. Ship routes may need to be changed when bad weather and poor sea conditions are predicted. Tourism activities that depend on weather water clarity of whale science opportunities benefit if the operators understand the local ocean conditions and can support sustainable economic development. This slide, what you can see here, is the European Union program Copernicus. It is real time in this slide where you learn about the ocean and you can select different parameters. In this case, it is the uh, salinity. The next slide is also from the European Union program Copernicus. On this slide, it's more advanced data presentation, and it's showing in real time the pH of the ocean. What is oceanographic data? Oceanographic data are the results 
of measurements of the ocean's physical, chemical, and biological parameters. These data describe the ocean atmosphere boundary layers, physical characteristics, and seawater properties subsurface distribution. Upper atmosphere observation taken from islands or ships are considered as conventional meteorological observations. There is a broad range of oceanographic data types. Oceanographic data are collecting using both so-called in situ methods and remote sensing. The most obvious remote sensing platform are satellites. But the scientific community uses also scientific aircrafts, special buoys, and small special research ships remotely. In situ ocean observation comes from different sources with varying degrees of quality. The highest quality data is collected during scientific research programs by instrumented buoys by ships specially designed to collect environmental data in coastal and land stations. Lower quality data, but also valuable, is collected by merchant ships collecting data on their shipping routes. For example, Maersk, a shipping giant, released its historical weather observation to the scientists and forecasting community last year. With this single decision, the company increased the amount of ocean weather data by 28%. The MERS example highlights how one global company's action can have a significant impact. However, the roughly 300 MERS ships follow standard shipping lines, limiting the spatial coverage of the resulting data and highlighting the need for collaboration with other industries. Fishing fleet vessels can also collect lower quality data during commercial fishing operations. A startup projected demonstrated last in the airport, sorry again, a startup project demonstrated the importance of such a decision two years ago. From June until September 2021, six fishing vessels in the North Sea contributed data to the European Copernicus Marine Data Aggregation. Nonetheless, these combined six vessels were among the largest single contributors of subsurface data in the North Sea, which speaks to the surprising lack of data in one of the world's most economically essential ocean regions. Because our knowledge about the ocean compared to other research area is so small, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, promoted and proclaimed the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development from 2021 to 2030. The slogan of the decade is, Science we need for the ocean we want. The first World Ocean Assessment, released in 2016, found that much of the ocean is in danger and seriously degraded with changes and losses in the structure, function, and benefits from marine systems. And UNESCO underlined the importance of oceanographic data, scientific understanding of the ocean's responses to increasing pressure is fundamental for sustainable development. Ocean observation, data collection, and research are essential to predict the consequences of change, design mitigation, and guide adaptation. You will find a ton of information on a very informative website at oceandecade.org. In our context now, I like to mention that UNESCO pledged to have at least 80% of the seabed mapped by 2030. That is a huge task. Do you have any idea what that means? Experts have calculated that we need 200 ship years to map the ocean. That means one ship needs 200 years to do the job, or 200 ships do the same job in one year. The estimated costs for such an effort is more than 3 billion US dollars. Hmm, you can ask who likes to pay for such an effort. 
Did you know that we mapped the Moon, Mars, and even Venus with a better resolution than the ocean? Or did you know that more people were walking on the Moon than visiting the deepest area in the ocean? Satellite imaging, and so when we're observing the ocean, satellite imaging for the ocean has a resolution of five kilometers. That means everything smaller than five kilometers from a satellite perspective, we don't know. For Mars, the resolution is six meters. And 100% of the moon is at least with 100 meters resolution mapped. I will show you here some slides where I call it Socratic paradox. We have more ocean data than ever before. Yet we do not have enough data to answer many critical questions. It seems that oceanographic science is a follower of Socrates. He, we know and are fully aware of how much we don't know, especially in understanding marine biodiversity, the seabed and areas beyond national jurisdiction. Ocean observation and the collection of oceanographic data will increase our knowledge, help keep our planet safe, and will play a crucial role in sustainable growth for the future. This slide now, I hope you can see it from behind, it's very small, but shows the Ocean OPS, Ocean Observing Platform Support. It's real time and shows worldwide the coverage and representation of the global system for observation, modeling, and marine and ocean data analysis. All the dots you can see there are platforms using to collect oceanographic data. That is the map from two days ago, Sunday. So I zoomed in, that is the map for the Caribbean region. It's the same data from last Sunday. You can see how a lot of the dots disappeared. And now I zoomed in to the region around Jamaica, and you see one single dot. It's in Port Royal, it's a gauge, but you cannot open it to see the details. I know what it is, it's measuring the water, uh, uh, the, the, the tide. So maybe you were thinking that's only the European, and they don't care much about the Caribbean Sea. But to see this map, that is from NOAA, also from the American uh, National Center for Atmospheric and Ocean Science. It's the same picture, a lot of science, but around the Caribbean area. The problem is when we are talking in the Caribbean area, area about small islands, we are in fact talking about big ocean states. Minister Bartlett mentioned it. But more important than the size is also in the Caribbean area is no space, no marine space beyond the jurisdiction. Everything is negotiated and there's a huge opportunity for better op uh, cooperation in the region. Jamaica, for example, and we heard it, has a 20 times bigger space in sea than land mass. It is roughly on land 10,000 square kilometer, and uh, as I mentioned, 25 times bigger when we're talking about the surrounding oceans, which is called exclusive, exclusive economic zone. In the worldwide ranking, Jamaica is positioned in 68. In the CARICOM region, only Bahamas has a bigger EEZ. In June 2021, the World Bank floated a tender for a blue economy baseland assessment in Jamaica. The World Bank specified the reason for the assessment in a document which is called TOR, Terms of Reference. I quote, Among the challenges are limited data for accessing and quantifying the economic value of ocean ecosystem, goods and services, and insufficient use of technology, policies and investment across blue economy sectors, end of quote. So what was the outcome 
the result so far for, from this assessment. I quote again, this time a little bit longer. The status of most fish and shellfish stocks in the country are poorly understood, again because of a lack of data. Currently, we, where data exists, it is often aggregated, inaccessible to those who need to use it. An inefficient central coordination of data gathering activities, a lack of human capacity for adequate mapping and monitoring of marine ecosystems, an insufficient infrastructure required for survey and sampling of offshore marine ecosystem, I'm still quoting, overall a critical barrier to presenting a comprehensive view of a blue economy is the lack of comparable data. In the case of Jamaica, adequate and useful data is important to develop an effective blue economy strategy. From a data perspective, respondents advised overcoming existing gaps via improving national ocean accounts, hydrographic surveying, and developing more local consultant, government, and academic specialists as expertise. More data could be provided on various threats and solutions towards reducing those risks like climate change, IUU fisheries, organized trucks, transnational crime, sargassum seaweed invasion, end of quote. There are many more hints in this report what should be improved. But I would like to continue with two issues just mentioned in my quoting where I think we can improve the situation. And that is the need for hydrographic surveying, mapping the ocean floor mainly, and to deal with the influx of sargassum seaweed. We see here the CMU Targo, a donation of a German civil and hydro hydraulic engineering company Targo, which is part of a bigger uh, Ludwig Freitag group. It was donated to us in summer 2019. The vessel has all the modern technical equipment necessary for safe operation on high seas. The vessel is equipped with modern appliances for the collection of oceanographic, of oceanographic data, especially hydrographic surveying, mapping the ocean, for example, sea floor, with a state-of-the-art multi-beam echo sounder and single beam and side scan echo sounder, both from Kongsberg, a specialized Norwegian company and one of the leaders in the industry. With the modern hardware installed, server and computers, and the use of a powerful software from a Dutch company, QPS, Quincy and Cloud, quick high-class data acquisition and processing is facilitated. Sensors and devices can be easily deployed from the quarter deck. The survey cabinet does provide sufficient space for additional components on operators if required. Before you ask why we don't use the vessel at the moment, I will explain that in a minute in the context of the following problem. That leads me to another very pressing problem where oceanographic data will help understand and solve it, the invasion of sargassum seaweed. Some call it the golden wave because, because of its potential economic value, but most hotel owners and guests will not cost, consider it gold. Satellite images uh, disappeared now, what? Okay, there was a satellite image showing the coverage of the Caribbean by Sargassum. The satellite image was showing roughly 1,000 square miles covered by Sargassum, which is three times more than usual. It illustrates the problem, the big problem for the greater Caribbean region. The Sargassum plume extent in the last years is significantly greater than most of the years during 2011 and 18 for the Caribbean. However, the reasons behind this record high plume are broadly discussed in the scientific community, but are yet not to be determined. Okay. 
I don't know what happened to the slide. The next slide would be coming back to the Targu, because we had a very nice in a project uh, intercepting sargassum close to valuable beaches with the CMU Targo. It was planned as a, uh, a common joint project by M MIT Boston, Center for Blue Economy and Innovation here at the CMU, and should be, uh, it was sought, uh, financed by the Tourism Enhancement Fund. Unfortunately, the project was stalled by COVID-19 pandemic, and the funding was not longer available anymore because the money was also used in more pressing issues. But the idea is still fascinating. Sargassum, close to valuable beaches, will be intercept, concentrated, and pumped down to a depth of more than 180 meters. Okay, there is someone who's running it for me. No, stop back. Oh, it's that. Okay, can I? Okay. Also, it's intercept, concentrated, and pumped down to a depth of more than 180 meters. Why? The bubbles responsible for floating of the seaweed, seaweed will burst and the sargassum, sargassum sinks down to the seafloor. It is also a very exciting and a promising project if you think about that we're talking in this moment then when the, uh, the, sargass the sargassum is going down about CO2 sequestration. I'm coming to an end because I had only 20 minutes, but I think that is important, especially for you, the students. I call it here the citizen scientists. The Marine Research Lab at the Florida International University developed an app for mobile phones to document the situation of sargassum seaweed. The app user can upload meaningful images to shores of, so of shore sections with sargassum. The data is stored centrally evaluated and in a transparent database for further analysis. The Sargassum Watch uses EpiCollect 5, a free open source citizen science app compatible with Android and iOS, developed at the Imperial College in London. Since almost all our students of the CMU have a mobile phone, I would like to suggest that we start an initiative to create an overview of the sargassum influx and contamination on Palisados Peninsula or surrounding areas. This slide, shows, uh, this slide here shows the main uh, page of the project. This slide shows the table view of the project. It's the, the last entry is from Sunday this week. And that's uh, the mapping. It's very interesting and you can see um, most of the data at the moment is collected in, in, uh, in Florida. We have six entries at the moment in, in the Caribbean and one, uh, two from them in, in Jamaica. So what are the challenges? The challenges are data collection and the process can be... Oh, no, that's a little... Um, okay, this one. The challenges is there's no good decision without good data. We need, better we need better mapping to understand the ocean better, and we need people, ships, advanced technology, global cooperation, and for all of money. The process of data collection itself can be, and in some cases, it is clearly not sustainable, or even has a negative impact. Single-use devices like Clyder or others, they can, add, they can add up in the waste pile in the ocean. We have consumption of fuel, we are pro producing CO2, and so on and so on. And we have the problem that the data cannot decide which different interest groups are using the data. So we have here different groups, I, I'm, I'm only mentioning here, ex the exploiting versus protecting. What is a perfect day for somebody who is collecting the data? That would be, we have all the data we want and need, but what now? Data itself will not make any decision. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. We we'll still need a strategy or a plan or a concept in which way and for what purpose we like to use the information we have. Another example is, for example, here now in Kingston Harbor, the cleaning activities and 
the waste interception at the end of the gullies. As important as it is, and I, I, I support it very much, all the data you can collect will it really change the course of it all. With all the critical knowledge and the relevant data to deal with the influx, what purpose it would serve if it will keep the mentality of throw the waste away, meaning out of the sight is out of the mind. So I had only 20 minutes, and time does not allow me to speak about potential influence of big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data mining, or quantum computer. I only saw recently an article how important this new technologies will be in, the, in, in oceanographic data. For example, in Norway, can you imagine in Norway they use now facial recognition, recognition software for, to make a nice picture of a single salmon, all of them in a cage, to see who of them escaped. Can you imagine? That is <laughs> unbelievable. I was not even aware that you can, make, can you recognize a salmon by his face. So that is maybe an interesting topic for one of the next lectures here, Royal, uh, Port Royal Lecture Series. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you have any questions, I'm still around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Smillen. I, I think certainly only he could have taken us through what many students may consider to be a, quite a drab topic of oceanographic data in the way that he did and still kept us captivated. Thank you, Ambassador. Lots of food for thought. And certainly the major takeaway from me for me, is, is that sargassum discussion because the same MIT guys were having a previous discussion with us at, at Tourism, right, Dr. Wallace? And it's almost like full circle. Here I am to discover they were also having that discussion at CMU. So we may need to look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll keep it moving because we're going to have the question and answer with all three gentlemen afterwards. So I want to invite at this moment Ambassador Olivier Goyonva, who is the ambassador of France in Jamaica, a role he assumed in October 2021. Ambassador Goyenvart has been with the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1996 and served as the Assistant Director of the Law of the Sea, River Law, and Polar Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Legal Affairs Department between 2012 and 2016. Ambassador Goyenvart is a firm believer in the sustainable development of deep ocean resources, and in September 2022, the French ambassador addressed the CMU industry conference, highlighting his desire for France and Jamaica to combine efforts to bring forth a safer and more effective maritime industry. Ambassador's address at the inaugural Port Royal lecture series at the CMU is entitled the UN Goal 7, Ocean-Based Locations for Renewable Energy. And I discovered something recently. He actually sings reggae quite well. He invited us to his residence for the Reggae Month festivities, and he was singing lots of Bob Marley. So outside of that, we're looking forward to Ambassador's very substantive presentation. Let us make him welcome. <laughs> Ambassador Goyenvart. Thank you very much for your kind words, Professor Spencer. Um, Honorable Minister Samuda, responsible for the environment, I uh, would like to salute Honorable Minister uh, Edmund Bartlett, Minister for Tourism, Ambassador Joachim Smila, Professor uh, Andrew Spencer, Professor Ajaguna, ladies and gentlemen, fellow students, because I consider myself as a diplomat as an ever student. When you, when you, when you Start, when you stop to learn, you are dead. Uh, so keep learning, keep, lear keep, keep learning. Good morning. Bonjour. Ah, I know some of you speak, le, 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 learn French. Uh, wagwan. <laughs> this is my reference to reggae. <laughs> Very happy to be here, and, but I should not be here today uh, because today is the first day of the diplomatic week. 
and, uh, but we, I agreed to come and I was very honored and happy to come here today. So I'm skipping the first day of Diplomatic Week this morning. So please do not say to Honorable Minister Kamina Johnson-Smith that I'm here with you today. Very happy to talk about this topic on marine renewable energy. You know, what is the, the difference between a diplomat and a scientist? A scientist knows everything about nothing. Because he studies very little subject, you know, so he, he knows everything about nothing. And the diplomat knows nothing about everything. So this morning I'm going to try to share with you my ignorance, we have talked about ignorance in this morning, and try to find together inspiration for our future. And I'm very happy to be here because what you are doing here is critical for the future of our societies, for the future of the world, and for the future of the countries, our countries. You are, you are representing the future and preparing the future. Well, I'm, I'm asking myself, what is, what is energy? And how do we use energy? Basically, I'm not a scientist, you are more or less engineer. Energy is a chemical reaction which creates movement. When you move your legs, you use glycogen and sugar in your, by, with your muscles, this reaction to create movement. And when you move your legs on your bicycle, you create this movement. And back in the days when we were young, we had some little dynamo generators on our bicycle, on, which was turning with the wheels, creating electricity for the light of the bicycle. So movement also creates energy. Energy creates movement, movement creates energy. On the globe, on the globe, where there is the most movement? On the seas. If you think about the wind, tides, waves, currents. And the oceans cover 70% of the, of, the, of, the, of the globe first, and 80% of the globe population lives at more or less 100 and 150 kilometers from the shores, from the sea. So we have a huge reserve, renewable reserve of energy in the oceans. And I've got some data, but I have some doubts of, on, the, on the reality of, the, of, of, the, of those data. But the, the, the calculation, the theoretical calculation of energy we could get from the oceans is something between five to 10 times of the global consumption of energy in the world. So theoretically, we could, we could find a reno, re, renewable energy for all the people in the world in the, in the oceans. So what kind of energy we can... So I'm going to, take, to talk about it like that, and then I'm going to give the example of France, because this is the, the subject that, that I ignore uh, less. And I would like to apologize for two things. First, for my broken English, and second, for the very primitive character of my PPT. I'm, I should learn, I should at least spend one semester in CMU to learn how to make as beautiful PPT as Professor Spencer, if you, if you, allow, if you allow me. So, and so I'm going to, ta to take the, 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 the example of France. Um, what kind of energy we, we find at sea? The first energy we find at sea is, and, and we, the one which is the most developed today, is wind farm. Wind farm because the seas you have more wind than on, 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 on land, basically. So wind farm. I would say that wind farm are not really marine energy. They are energy which are generated at seas, but they are not because you can have wind farm on shores also. So. But off, offshore wind farms, fixed or floating today is the most developed um, uh, marine re re renewable energy uh, uh, system. You have Tidal energy, the energy which we can get from the tides, the difference of tides. Here in Jamaica, you don't have a lot of, the tides are very, very limited, very small. But in some places in the world, especially in France, we have very, very high tide. So I'm going to, to develop on that. Uh, we can also tap on the ocean currents energy. There is also huge energy to tap on. 
currents, you know better than me, it's like, like, like rivers uh, which are un underwater. We can use also the, what we call ocean thermal energy conversion. I'm going to give you an, an example. The use of the difference of temperature between deep, uh, the deep water and the, and, and the shallow water. And there is also a new, very new kind of energy, which is, which is the osmotic energy, which shows the difference, difference of salinity between seawater and river waters. But this one is really at the, at the state of, of, of research. In France, in France, we have a huge potential for uh, marine energy. And the, can you come back to the previous? previous? Yes, pre previous. Um, France has a second largest EEZ in the world, 11 million uh, square kilometers, and half of those, half of those um, EEZ are generated by Polynesia in the, in, the, in the middle of the Pacific. So basically, basically today, marine renewable energy are produced within the realm of the territorial seas, which is 12 nautical miles, not, not, basically not, not more. Um, a, a, a third, a third of, of, of the borders of France are maritime border. I, I mean, metropolitan France. And we have three seas, the Channel, Atlantic Ocean, and the Medi Mediterranean Sea. So we have big potential on, on, on that. And uh, there, is, there, there is wind. We have open ocean uh, in front of the, of the Atlantic. So this is um, um, lo 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 lots of wind. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the, the currents um, and so on. Um, we have, can you, the next slide, please? So this is a part, uh, I'm, I'm sorry it's in French, this is a part of renewable, uh, of energy in the en energy mix uh, of France. You see that the, the big yellow shrink is nuclear energy, so we have, uh, this is one of the characteristic or characteristic of France is the, uh, the big shrink of nuclear energy. Um, then you have uh, hydroelectric with, uh, with a barrage. Uh, see, see um, a wind, wind, wind farm, 7%, uh, coal and oil uh, plants, only, only 7%. That's one of the reasons why the, the French production of electricity, electricity is one of the lowest in terms of CO2 um, emission. And here you can see that marine energy does not appear because it's less today, less than 0.5%. Uh, a percent, and on the on the left part, um, you have the mi energy mix in terms of re renewable energy, um, and you see also that the marine ener en marine energy, which is which is the last one, the very last one in, in purple, is very very small. So we are we are late in terms of renewable marine energy, despite the fight, the fact that the potential in France is is huge. Uh, why um, most um, my interpretation is that we rely a lot on nuclear energy uh, and uh, so for, for that reason during a long period of time uh, it, it assure independence in terms of energy for France so we didn't do a lot of research on other energies but now uh, we know that we need to go to the energy transition to go more uh, towards renewable energy and uh, the strategy of France is within 2040 uh, to have 40% of renewable energy within our um, er, uh, energy mix. So we have to develop more uh, marine renewable energies uh, and it started only in the years uh, 2000s. The, the, the first really serious research, research and the first uh, implementation, implementation of, of industrial uh, trials for renewable, marine renewable energy uh, started in 2000, uh, in, the, in the years 2000, and in 2009 uh, there was a big conference organized by the, 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 by, by the, by the government uh, to put everyone together uh, to see what we can do in terms of perspective and strategic to develop those uh, renewable um, energies. Um, what is, what are the, 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 the challenges for those uh, marine um, energy. First, we need to reduce the cost of development of this kind of, of industrial energy because it's difficult to do that. So the administration, the government uh, is giving a lot of money 
uh, for in terms of uh, research. We need to increase the capacity. Um, we need to master uh, the environmental impact because today the, everything has to be, uh, every industry has to be evaluated in terms of env environmental um, impact. To take into account the different use of the seas. Um, can you, we go to the next slide, please? Yes, um, this is a map of France with the different uh, uh, project of renewable um, energy. We need to take into account the different use of, of, of the seas because um, the shores of France have been exploited since, since the Middle Age, uh, basically. So we have a lot of fisheries uh, for fish, for mollusks also, which are very, you have the con conch here in, in, in Jamaica. We have this type of we have mussels, uh, we have oysters, some of the best, best oysters in the world, uh, etc., etc., which are traditional, traditional fishing industry, and we are, all those new energy uh, has to be, have to be accommodated with those uh, use of the sea. And we have also a lot of tourism. This morning, Minister Bartlett talked talk to us about tourism. Tourism is very important in France. It's 12% of the GDP of France, tourism, so it, 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 it's more than, more than the automotive economy, uh, industry, for instance. And the, the seashore tourism is very, very developed, uh, especially uh, f uh, um, uh, recreative fishing, uh, sailing, etc., etc. So we have also to accommodate all those use of, of, the, of, of the seas. Can we go, so this is this map, this map, I don't know if I can, no. You see the map or not? Yes, you can see the map. Yes, yes. So, so you can see on the, on the, on the north, the deep, deep, green, deep green is the, um, the, the, the wind farms, uh, fixed wind farms, and uh, light green is the project of floating, uh, floating wind farms. And for instance, you can see in the channel that those conflict of use, because on the north part, Normandy, Brittany, this is a channel, lots of traditional fisheries, which are very, very, very valuable. Um, lots of tourism and also navigation. The, 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 the channel is the, is the, the, the busiest, uh, I think it's a, it might be the, one of the busiest navigation channel in the world. So we have, you have to accommodate um, all, all these. And today in France, we have 11 projects of wind farms um, at, at seas. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, this is all the, you, you can see the, 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 the different uh, projects. Some are ongoing and some are still at the stage of, of planification. Can we go to the next slide, please? This is the first renewable sea energy project in France and is back to 1966. And this is the first ever tied uh, electric plant which was uh, built in the world. Uh, there is only another one today in, in Korea, in South, South, South Korea, which was built, I think, five or six years ago. So this, this plant has been in, in, uh, in action since 1966, and it, used, it uses the different of tide, uh, when you have some very specific, uh, uh, very specific coast, and in the north of France, and especially in Brittany, which is my home, my home, my home country. <laughs> I should not say country, but my home, the place I come from. I, I, I grew up by the sea. Uh, this is on north of Brittany. I come from the south. South Brittany is more reggae. <laughs> the, the configuration of the coast makes that you have a difference of 15 meters between low tide and high tide. 15 meters between low tide and high tide. And so you, can you can imagine, this is one of the, the highest in the world, one of the highest differences between low tide and high tide. So we use, the, this plan use this difference. When, by, when the, the rising tide, the water comes into the barrage and will turn the turbines. Then they close, they close the barrage wait for the tide to go down and use the accumulated water 
to turn the turbine in the other, in the other sense. And this happened twice a day. Twice a day, it's regular, predictive. It's not like the wind. Today there is wind, tomorrow there is no wind. As a sea kayaker, I'm always watching the wind in the morning for, to go to, 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 go to sea, sea kayaking. If there is no wind here, I go sea kayaking, but if there is wind, I don't. So, twice a day, absolutely regular. It's an absolutely regular energy. Very, 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 very good energy. This plant serves a population of 250 people. Thousand, 200, 250,000 people. So it's, it's very, it, it, it's huge. Um, the, it's really, 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 it's reliable. The, diff, the, the, the problem today is the environmental impact. It means that when you close a river, when you close this kind of ecosystem, you will change totally the ecosystem. And the ecosystem has, has changed. The ecosystem is really, uh, resilient today, but it, it has changed. What we could do in 1966 probably would not be possible today because if we do the environmental impact assessment of such a project, lots of people will say no because you are going to, to, to change the ecosystem too much. Well, so that, that, and then we go to the issue of social acceptability of new energy and of those uh, marine energy. So France was pioneer with this kind of, uh, of energy. Can we have the next slide, next slide please? And since the beginning of the, of the 2000, uh, this, pro this is the first project of, to use the, the current, uh, current energy, also in Brittany, because in Brittany also we have very, very strong currents, of the, of some of the strongest, strongest uh, currents uh, in the world, where there is very, very few navigation, not, not a lot of navigation or very, very small boats. And this, um, this um, uh, current uh, I didn't make my, my research correctly. I, I don't even know how to call that in English. What would you call this kind of machinery in English? In French, we call it hydro, uh, hydro, hydro tur turbine. It's put on the, on the seabed at 50 meters depth and turns uh, uh, like that. That was the first, the, first, uh, the, the, the first project. We can go to the next slide, please. The second project, the open hydro. This is a different technology. The center, is, the center is, is empty and it turns around a circle. Circle. This is supposed to be less uh, impact, less impact on, on fish, especially on, on, on fishes because f some fishes can be, can be damaged uh, by, that, by that. And there is a third project on the next slide. This one, which is this time which is vertical. So whatever the, 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 the direction of the current this uh, system is going to be able to use current from whatever direction it, it comes and there is less uh, impact on, on the environment. So this kind of energy is also very reliable because currents, currents are, are permanent, not, not like wind. Um, uh, it's, uh, there is no impact on, on, the, on, on, on the scenery because you cannot see them. You, you see the wind farms. And some people don't want to have the wind farms because they say that is going to damage my, 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 my beautiful view. Uh, there is no impact on, on, on the view. The difficulty with that is servicing is very complicated. You cannot do the services on the water, so you have to lift them up. Some, some especially in, in Scotland or in the UK, they have po big poles where they, they put those, those, those propellers so that they can lift them to service and then put them back into the water. Uh, for this kind of system, it's not possible. The, the marine environment is very, very corrosive, so we need to use new materials for, for, for that. And you have a lot of species like uh, seaweeds or mollusks who, who stick to, those seas, to, to, to everything which is under the, under the water, so you need to use a lot of anti-fooling chemical uh, anti fooling chemicals, which could have also an impact on the environment. So there are pro and cons on, um, on that. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? This is a very a small, a small French company de developed this system um, since the last five years. Uh, it's, the idea is to use the same technology as well, whales or fishes uh, with um, a, a, tie, um, a tail fin. 
this mimics a tail fin, and when the, when, when the whales are moving the tail fin, they create energy to move. Here, the system uses currents at seas or in rivers, which will make these artificial tail fin move, and they use, with some collectors along, along, the, along the fin, they, and they use collectors to, to create electricity. So this is, at the very beginning, they, start a, a small, they have started a small demonstrator at sea, and they use this system, they start the, the small, this company is selling this system into farming communities, to uh, countryside communities, to use the energy of rivers, or small rivers. And there is no impact because you don't need to have a barrage. You just put the fin within, in the water, the fin moves and it creates uh, electricity. It looks very, very simple, but I would like to, all those, uh, all those energy, most of those energy, except, except wind farm, are still at the stage of research or the start of development. But some, some, something started 300,000 years ago. It continued in 1909 and was achieved in 1969. What started in 1909 and was achieved in 1969? Homo sapiens, we are all brothers and sisters because we are all from the same, sp same species, Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is 300,000 years old. In 1906 was the first flight by the brother Wright, the first flight of a plane with, with an engine. In 1969, Armstrong put his boot on moon. 300,000 years and then 60 years. Within 60 years, for men, human beings, for the first time flew. 60 years after, we were on the moon. So, innovation is going faster and faster. So we can be confident that this kind of technology are going to move and be created and developed faster and faster. And here in Jamaica, in CMU, you really have a role to play in terms of research and development of this, kind, this type of new um, energy. We can also use the, 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 the chemical energy of the seas. Can we go to the next, uh, next, next slide, please? Right. This, is a, this system is, is, is quite simple. The idea is to pump water at six, 700 meters depth, which is always at four degrees, to raise the water and to exchange this cold water with a system of, of uh, fresh water to do climatization. Cl climatization, this is called seawater, air, climate, air, uh, how to say climatization in air, air conditioning, well, sorry, <laughs> air conditioning. So you, you, to use the seawater for air conditioning. So you, you tap the seawater at 600, 700 meters, which at four degrees, raise the seawater. When the seawater uh, arrives at the sea level, it's at seven, between seven and 10 degrees. You exchange this cold seawater with an internal a closed circuit of fresh water, and the fresh water will come out of the circuit at 12, 12 degrees someone, and this is used to make um, air conditioning of buildings. And the, the first and the most successful system was built in Tahiti, so in French Polynesia, in, and it's operative since 2020, and it's for the climatization of an hospital because an hospital needs, needs a lot of, a lot of, of cold, cold energy for the room and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they could see that this system is 10 times more efficient than the older system they had in terms of energy. And in terms of budget, they could reduce the budget of energy of 40%. In French Polynesia, there is only one, one uh, electric plant. So it's one of the places where the electricity is the... Uh, is the, the most expensive in the world. And the system is, is, working, is working very very well, very, very well. It's the only system of that size in the world today, but which country could you, what, what could you see, what country could use this kind of system which has big 
facilities close near to the sea, you have to be very near to the sea, and you need to have a kind of ocean trench with cold water. Are you thinking of a country? Hmm? Yeah, it could be Jamaica. North coast of Jamaica, we have seen on the map by Ambassador Schmiller that you have in the north of Jamaica uh, deep sea, you have some deep sea close to the sea and you have all the big hotels in the north, northern coast of Jamaica which could be refreshed and air conditioned with this kind of, of system. So it, it might be, it might be a, a solution uh, also for, 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 for Jamaica. Voilà. I think what is um, important in this kind of, um, of, uh, of project is the social acceptability. And this is a, a critical issue in France uh, because there is always this, this, this uh, reflex of not, not in my backyard. And the problem is especially with wind farms. Uh, France is developing wind farms and there is more and more resistance uh, in terms of installing uh, wind, wind farms. You know, what is the impact of a wind farm. Every wind mill needs to use at least 500 tons of concrete and metal only to, you know, to, to put it in the ground. And this land is not going to be, you cannot use this land anymore after. And you will need to build the wind, the, 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 the wind mill itself and so on. So the, the, the environmental impact can be, can be important. When you put this wind mill at seas, uh, you have less impact in terms of use of land. Uh, but in France, uh, many communities, uh, local communities, are against that. Uh, fishermen, fishermen are very reluctant to see those wind farms because it, it, it makes more difficult uh, to use their, 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 their fishing, uh, fishing vessels. Uh, local residents uh, also are not really uh, favorable because it is going to, to break the, the, the perspective on, on, on the seas. There is a phenomenon in France that lot of, lot, lots of people, wealthy people in cities buy second houses for their holidays by the sea and those people are really, very really reluctant uh, with that. But the state, the government is pushing for this kind of, uh, of project and the local, local um, uh, uh, city council, uh, local authorities are also, are, are also in favor of that because they can get tax from uh, wind farms. So it, it, go, it pulls also money uh, in the local economy. And there are always this, it's always difficult to, to, to strike a balance between those, those, those different interests. So before the installation of this kind of, of project, especially wind farm that sees, um, the, the, the government has to do a lot of consultations uh, ask uh, the opinion of the local residents, of the industry, etc., etc., and after the, all those consultations, to make kind of pedagogy to explain to people uh, what is good and beneficiary for the for the for everyone. Um, so to conclude, because I've been too long already, um, as I mentioned, I think that uh, you really have a, a role to play here in the CMU in terms of of um, of, of research and development of this kind of, uh, of project, and that's the reason why I'm very happy to be here. We are try, trying with Professor Spencer and Professor Ajaguna uh, a new cooperation with the French Maritime um, Institute. Uh, they have a new president, a new young and talented president, so that's the reason why it, it took a more time than we expected uh, to, to launch uh, this project, but I, I had a phone call with them yesterday and they're really uh, willing, willing to move forward. Voilà. And you are the future, you are the future of those energy and those maritime energy can save the world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a big thank you to Ambassador. And my French has improved since I went to sit down. To Ambassador Olivier Guillaume-Var. And I, 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 I think it's kind of fortuitous that his presentation was on energy, and we saw his level of energy in that presentation, right? I see you fully engaged our students. Thank you, Ambassador. We'll get into some of the discussion points a little later on, but I want to invite at this point a very important minister.
Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda, who is a minister with our portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. His specific responsibilities are water, environment, climate change, and the blue and green economies. What more suited minister to be here? Minister Samuda was honored with the privilege of serving Jamaica through his appointment to the Cabinet of Jamaica, which is the executive arm of the state. This has followed his appointment to the upper house as a senator. He's a passionate advocate where environmental preservation and protection are concerned. And in 2016, he led the tabling of a private member's motion in the Jamaican parliament, which resulted in the ban on single-use plastic and styrofoam in 2019. He's a founding partner of the island's first full-service recycling company, One Jamaica Recycling, and in 2016, he tabled the... Okay, I'm repeating that. But Minister Samuda's address today is entitled The Role of Caribbean Territories in Blue Economy Optimization. And just before we welcome him on stage, he was very instrumental in our early discussions in the birth of a series such as this, dubbed the Port Royal Lecture Series. So we could not have the inaugural one without Minister giving the closing address. Let us make Senator the Honorable Matthew Samuda welcome to the podium. Thank you so much, Prof. It's indeed a joy and a privilege to join you at the inaugural Port Royal Lecture Series. I extend welcome to our visiting guests and indeed extend greetings to all dignitaries. Port Royal is a very special place. CMU's presence in Port Royal is particularly important. It is a unique value proposition to have the country's only maritime university, and indeed perhaps the Caribbean's only maritime university, located it in what was the preeminent shipping city in the Western Hemisphere a few hundred years ago. Now, fast forward, skip past several disasters or events, as we would have been told, and you have what's dubbed a sleepy fishing village when you look online at some of the descriptions that are there. But to me, if we're going to describe it as sleepy, it is a sleeping giant. And the renaissance that will come to Port Royal has to be led by the thought leadership that will come from this university. And I think positioning CMU as the thought leader for maritime affairs, certainly in this hemisphere, and dubbing it and branding it, using what is an interesting and significant value proposition, is an important step. So I congratulate the university. I thank the professor for his kind words. It really is his baby. I just participated in a brainstorming session, but it is a very important step, I believe, for the university and indeed for Port Royal. Now, the role of the Caribbean territories in the blue economy optimization. It's a mouthful, but in essence, what is the blue economy? What is our role in that economy? The American Blue Economy Strategy by NOAA looks at five primary focus initiatives for growth. These are marine transportation, I understand that's actually a course here, ocean exploration, seafood competitiveness, tourism and recreation, and indeed coastal resilience. Now, how is that important to Jamaica? Jamaica is an ocean state. It's the third largest English-speaking country in the hemisphere. We have an EEZ 24 to 25 times our land mass, and it, we also possess the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. We have 52,826 square nautical miles within our EEZ and a coastline of 1,022 kilometers. 
But what's interesting is that we also have a population, 70% of which live within five kilometers of the sea. Now, if you think about it, all of our settlements are very close to the ocean. Anywhere you are in Jamaica, you can pretty much look out and see the sea. But most Jamaicans don't see us as an ocean state. And I actually find that very different from our neighbors in the Eastern Caribbean. Most Jamaicans don't know what it means to be an ocean state. We use the word island very loosely. We have fishermen in Jamaica who cannot swim. As the prime minister, in, and I don't recall who he was quoting at the time, but it's a quote which has stayed with me, will tell you in many ways Jamaica has turned its back to the sea. I look at this particular inaugural Port Royal lecture series as the moment that we turn and face the sea and establish our thought leadership on the blue economy. What are Jamaica's blue assets? Firstly, the location. Jamaica is blessed and cursed with where we are. An unsophisticated view of Jamaica's crime situation often ignores that the very benefit we have from our geographic location is a contributing factor to some of the issues we face with our safety and security. But no doubt should exist that it is indeed a significant blessing and the good outweighs the bad. We have a massive logistics capacity. So our location and the size of our EEZ, first asset. The water, the, the possible water usage and energy that can come from it. The marine land. We often think about Jamaica as a single island. But even where we are now is very close to several keys that Jamaica can leverage. The underwater deposits, something that we've not had much discussion about, but a huge blue asset in our potential minerals and potential oil. I believe we will find oil and gas in our lifetime. Whether we'll be able to use it with where the economy is and how we consume energy is a different matter at that time. But I believe we'll find it. The food. Jamaica is blessed with a pelagic flow that is rich. Not often extracted sustainably, but it is rich. The view. The sea, the keys, the reefs creates the base of significant leisure. We also, because so much of us had turned our back to the sea, don't recognize the blue society as I have dubbed them as an asset. These are our fisher folk. But guess who else is in that blue society? The students of CMU. There are others as well, but this is an asset. Our people are always our primary asset. Our blue visitors, the blue talent, and indeed the ocean education which is taking place here. But our blue economy, and I would venture to say right throughout the region, represents unrealized assets which are not widely understood. I heard Prof, well rather Prof told me that in his introduction he may have borrowed my supposition, which is that the Jamaican ocean is significantly more valuable than the Jamaican land. Well, that's an important point. Is the Caribbean going to see the shared heritage, as we refer to in the law of the sea, or the shared ocean that we have as being more valuable and approach our economic dev development in that way? Now, how are we going to convert this potential, this awesome value that we are blessed with? Well, the location, first opportunity for significant conversion. Jamaica enjoys a mature interaction with the global shipping industry. We enjoy increasing support from new infrastructure investments and growing relevance from logistics partners. But by any standard, the revenue retention in Jamaica is not high enough. And that is something that we must work at. And the only way that the revenue retention is going to grow is by ensuring that we are adequately staffing this industry, which means CMU has to be much bigger.
Our proximity to the Panama Canal is not something that we should scoff at. It gives us immeasurable opportunities. The relevant MDAs that look at our shipping industry, being the ministries, departments, and agencies, include the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Investment and Commerce, indeed local government and finance. Now, you all would be very familiar with the Port Authority, the Marina Authority, NEPA, FCJ, Development Bank of Jamaica, and the SES Authority. But the true driver of growing our relevance in the shipping industry, increasing our retention of earnings in Jamaica, is going to be our skilled labor. There is no way around that. And that must come from you. The other massive opportunity that is not widely understood, but becomes more relevant every cyclical drought event that we experience, is the water. We think of the water purely in a beautiful, as being a beautiful sightseeing event. We think of the possibility of you know, enjoying it for leisure. We think of the food leverage. But Jamaica has developed in a haphazard way. We did not develop where we have our primary water sources. We developed in many ways where we had the greatest access to shipping wharfs. So Kingston Harbor was naturally chosen based on that. But where is our water? Jamaica has five times more land water than we can consume, even with our current issues. We, however, don't live near most, most of us don't live near that water. And the cost of extracting quite a bit of this water is very expensive because a lot of it is deep. A lot of our wells will have to go to 500 feet. The cost of extracting that is very, very heavy. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, based on where we've developed, that we will have to consider the value of the water around us. And I will touch on water a bit more later. The other asset that we've not thought about in our economic development, and much of the Caribbean has made this mistake, is we've not sought to leverage our marine land. Jamaica is an archipelagic state. We cannot have square footage of land which is very valuable, not contributing to the value that our citizens need. I mentioned underwater deposits. That speaks for itself, massive opportunities. The opportunity that I believe, however, has the greatest inclusive potential for us, however, is the development of the fishing industry. We largely do artisanal fish fishing in Jamaica. That's not going to contribute to the bottom line in the way that we would want. We have very rich water. Some of the tuna, for instance, that you would buy in canned products in the supermarket swims right past us off the coast of St. Thomas. But where are the skilled sailors who are going to go to sea in the vessels of scale to extract sustainably that asset? Massive opportunity for us. So often when we think about sailing, we think about the large carrier vessels, but we generally ignore the fact that we have a massive opportunity in food, we will have a massive opportunity in extraction, and we will have an increasing opportunity in leisure if we leverage our keys and if we protect our space. Now, there are problems with our oceans. Minister Bartlett will tell you that there is ecotourism, there's sports tourism, there's leisure tourism, there's business tourism. But Minister Bartlett, as much as he can define all things tourism, will never be able to tell you about garbage tourism because it simply doesn't exist. And the truth is, in turning our backs to the sea, we have not protected this blue asset that we have. So for all of the potential that these, this asset gives to Jamaica, we have damaged it. For 50 years, we have had poor waste management. Our sewage capacity has been weak. We have overfished our waters, certainly in the near shore environment, losing four out of nine species that would have been visible and easily found 60 years ago. 
But all is not lost. We have the opportunity to ensure that we protect our sensitive ecosystems around us. Now, there is a slide that I asked them to put up, which if they could show, I would appreciate it. The, the first point before I dive into this space that I'd like to, to address is the issue of economic growth and job creation in the context of environmental protection. In 2016, when the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation was formed, there was a lot of concern. Why is the environment and climate change being addressed in this space? It was a huge ministry. It has housing, it has logistics, it has land, it has works, it has water, um, logistics. I mean, it's a huge ministry. But the Prime Minister felt it important to not separate the issue of environmental protection from environmental growth. When he went to the UN in 2016, in his first presentation as then PM to the UNGA, he made the comment that sustainable economic growth cannot be achieved through environmental degradation, nor can inclusive prosperity be achieved through pollution. Now, the world has particular challenges. Jamaica doesn't live in a bubble. This is what's called the triple planetary crisis. It reflects the issues that we face in very large overarching topics. The triple planetary crisis looks at the issue of climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation. Now, climate change, buzzword. We discuss it, you can't turn on the news without hearing about it, but often it's discussed as a future concept as opposed to acknowledging that the climate has already changed at a pace that much of humanity was not ready for. We have already altered our ecosystems. When they throw buzzwords like 1.5 to stay alive, it gives the impression that 1.5 is a great thing. 1.5 in many ways is the equal sharing of misery across much of society. And that should scare you, rightfully. But in the context of the blue economy, the climate is already having, the climate change rather, and the rate of climate change is already having a devastating impact on the health of our oceans. It's why Jamaica joins its Caribbean neighbors in raising its voice every opportunity we get to ensure that more developed nations make the investments necessary for the energy conversion required to mitigate against further temperature increases. It's why Jamaica would have been one of the first nations to complete its adaptation plan. It's why Jamaica was the 11th country on earth to submit what's called its NDCs, its nationally determined contributions, which said we would cut our emissions as small as we are by 40% by 2030. It's why Jamaica was co-chair of the NDC partnership. It's why the prime minister spent a good portion of his time in 2018 working with President Macron and the Amir Qatar to raise the $100 billion required to help developing nations like Jamaica adapt. But that adaptation has to take very seriously the health of the ocean, as well as the destructive impact of the ocean for a state like Jamaica. So there's much to unpack in dealing with this element of the triple planetary crisis. Now, every element is intertwined, it's interrelated. Biodiversity loss is increasing at a rate also because of the warming ocean. Many of these sensitive ecosystems did not contemplate the temperatures they're experiencing. We're seeing glaciers disappearing. We're seeing loss of habitat because of some of our construction. We're also seeing that the rate of nutrient flow, which is sewage and agricultural runoff, going into nearshore environments is damaging our nearshore environment. So our own actions on land, in many ways, are damaging our blue economic prospects. So environmental protection cannot be separated from the discussion of economic growth. It cannot be separated from economic development. And that, if nothing else, is what I hope you will take away from discussion. The other element on the land degradation, which you should consider, is the issue of pollution. Marine plastic pollution threatens the health of our blue economic prospects. I mentioned there is no garbage tourism. There's also no fillet plastic bottle. So it damages your food prospects, it damages your leisure prospects. It also doesn't go very well with shipping. 
When garbage gets caught in some of your equipment, I'm sure it's a disaster. So the reality is we have to deal with it. Now, how is Jamaica going to deal with its chronic waste problem? It's not just limited to plastics, but certainly it's a chronic problem. The first thing we're going to do, and the Prime Minister has already announced, is ensure that we launch a waste to energy program. This will generate some 60 megawatts of energy. Now, what is waste to energy? It creates an economic model where the waste is then turned back into energy so the value earned from it can facilitate wider collection. Now, there's no silver bullet. Our problem is developed over longer than we've been independent. The reality is some of our infrastructure doesn't lend itself to good waste, waste collection. It's why we have to redevelop many of our degraded areas. It's why we have to ensure roadways are wide enough for trucks to even be able to collect the waste where it is collected. But even within that space, there are things that we don't want in our waste stream. It's why from your very young in primary school, let's say reduce, reuse, recycle. It's because you don't want plastics to enter your waste stream in the way that they do. You don't want toxic chemicals to enter the waste stream in the way that we so flippantly allow these days. It's why in 2019, Jamaica moved to start the process of banning some single-use plastics. It's why Jamaica will ensure that in 2023, we legislate a deposit refund scheme that forces people to bring bottles back. It's why we're also looking at several regulations around particular toxic chemicals, because the reality is putting them into the marine environment in the way that we have for 60 years damages your economic prospects. When somebody throws a garbage a garbage bag or something out the window of a bus, they damage the economic prospects, not just of CMU graduates, but of all of us. Because if we accept that the blue economy could be valued more than the land-based economy, then every time someone does something like that, that finds a way into our maritime or marine environment, they actually make us a little poorer. So there's a direct consequence for the decisions that we make. Now, the blue economy is a massive opportunity, huge opportunity. And I think the prospects for growth are clearly visible in this room. I have no doubt that the Caribbean will get it right. I see great ideas and great things happening across our brother and sister nations. Now, we have some structural issues to deal with, and we are on the front lines of the climate change crisis. But I think if we continue to gather like this, Prof. Spencer, and share and look at the opportunities, Jamaica will lead the way in the region in optimizing our blue economy, economic possibilities. I will, just in two minutes, if you'll allow me, Prof, touch a current issue that I think you should be aware of. Because as much as I want you to leverage from the blue economy, you still do live on land, and I do need to speak to a current issue that we face. Jamaica is in the throes of meteorological drought. You don't need me to tell you that. You can see the dry hillsides. You can see forest fires. You can see the several issues that we're facing. Jamaica, having found itself in cyclical drought, as we have several times before, is feeling the impacts of 60 years of chronic underinvestment in your, in your water sector. Now, that doesn't just affect us at the household level, it affects you if ships come here to dock and need fresh water to pick up. It, it, it has an effect at every level of commerce, every level of society, every level of health. But I've heard a narrative over the last couple of days, and I suspect part of it is because of, you know, some frustration for a number of reasons. Um, but it is ill-informed. The parliamentary opposition made a comment, or put out a statement, I believe, at the end of last week, that spoke to the lack of planning being the issue in Kingston and St. Andrew in particular, and its um, particular water lock-off. So they're wrong and right all at the same time. Because we built where we shouldn't have. We shouldn't necessarily have been in Kingston if water was at the core of our development decision. But that aside, it ignored the fact that more investment is going into your water infrastructure than has ever been made before. Now, if you could show the other slide with the, the other pins, the green and the yellow ones, I'd like to start there. 
What you see in front of you is $4 billion of capital investment made last year into our water infrastructure. Storage, distribution, some energy projects. You see, A, that it wasn't limited to Kingston and St. Andrew because we don't govern solely for Kingston and St. Andrew. Every parish would have benefited. This is the most amount of capital projects ever done on our water infrastructure. Now, why was this important? It was because in, nine, in 2016, 71% of our water collected, stored, and processed was either leaked or stolen. So building a more resilient network is absolutely critical, and we are well underway in that space. The green dots represent completed projects. The yellow ones with the star represent the ones that actually had the time to attend the closing ceremony of such projects. Now, if you could go to the other slide for me, which has the white, the white dots, and I'll just be another minute, Prof. Thank you for indulging me. This represents projects currently underway in building additional storage in replacing old rotting pipelines, and this represents what will be some $7 billion of infrastructure investment, up from $4 billion last year. As we target reduction of non-revenue water, as we target increased storage and greater resilience in our water sector. Now, anybody who's ever procured a, a service from government can tell you, this took years of planning. So, the argument about planning is rubbish. The reality is, we have a lot of work to do in a very short period of time if we're to leverage the value of our assets on land and leverage the value of our assets at sea. And we are on the front lines of climate change which exacerbate the problem and means we have to work that much faster if we're to take advantage of the systems that we have. I could go on and on on environment and climate change but I do know that we have now passed the time that had been allocated for this session. I do thank you for the opportunity to speak at this lecture series, and I look forward to the students of CMU leading the way in developing the Caribbean's blue economy, and indeed, eventually inviting other schools to participate from other parts in the world in this all-important Port Royal lecture series. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when responsibility meets passion. You get dynamism. Another round of applause for Minister Samuda. Thank you for staying with us. Just stay with us a little bit longer. We're going to go into a very important, very short video while we get prepared for a short Q&A. We'll have you out of here by 12.30, we promise. So at this point, I invite you to tune in to this presentation. The Caribbean Maritime University is the birthplace for industry leaders in the maritime sector. What started as a partnership between the Norwegian and Jamaican governments in 1980 has flourished into a university specializing in maritime education, applied research, and training for industry personnel in the maritime sector. As the first specialized public university and the only international maritime organization recognized university in the English-speaking Caribbean, we continue to redefine maritime excellence through education, research, and innovation. How do we achieve this? Through fully developed and robust curricula in three faculties and one specialized center. The Faculty of Marine and Nautical Studies is of utmost importance as a marine-focused institution. Its focal point is training seafarers and multidisciplinary engineers to analyze, develop, and determine the solution to problems encountered in the local, regional, and global industries. The Bachelor of Engineering degree in Marine Engineering and the Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Transportation are the vehicles through which we achieve this. But it does not stop there. The faculty also offers part-time training to become master or chief mate and chief engineer or second engineer officer among other areas. Marine engineering is one of many kinds of engineering offered at the CMU. Through the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Technology, candidates develop 
the necessary skills, competences, and attitudes which are required to function in a complex and rapidly changing engineering environment. The programs offered in this faculty take full advantage of computer-aided engineering tools and artificial intelligence to educate the multifaceted engineer. The future created through technology is here, and CMU is at the forefront. We have developed programs such as the Master of Science and Bachelor of Engineering degrees in Industrial Systems and the Bachelor of Engineering degrees in Electronics and Industrial Automation, ensure that we meet the demands of quality individuals who can solve problems efficiently. We also offer Bachelor of Science degrees in Artificial Intelligence and Computer Science, Marine Biotechnology, and an Associate of Applied Sciences degree in industrial systems operations and maintenance through this faculty. Engineers ensure that we fully utilize technology and that we can produce at faster rates. Faculty of Shipping and Logistics bridges the gap between producers and consumers. As our largest faculty, it offers a diploma in shipping and logistics and a Bachelor of Science in Logistics and Supply Chain Management. We also offer Bachelor of Science degrees in Port Management, International Shipping, Customs Processes, Freight Forwarding, and Immigration, Cruise Shipping, and Marine Tourism. No other institution in Jamaica and the Caribbean offers this breadth of training and response to the needs of the maritime and related industries in this way. To take this a step further, the Center for Security, Counterterrorism, and Non-Proliferation is responsible for delivering all security programs at the same time. It aims to prepare professionals for leadership positions across various sectors such as marine, transport, tourism, and cyberspace protection. Yes, cyberspace protection. Our programs are diverse and account for cybersecurity, digital forensics, police sciences, forensic science, security administration, counterterrorism, and international security matters. Thus, we offer Bachelor of Science degrees in Security Administration and Management, Cybersecurity and Digital Forensics, Forensic Sciences, Industrial Security Management and Police Sciences. We also offer postgraduate studies in Strategic Counterterrorism and a Master of Science degrees in Security Studies and Security Administration and Management. The CMU, a maritime university for global leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. We have a short Q&A with our very distinguished panel today. You would have heard their presentations. We heard things from our first presenter who you engaged before on the issue of the moral responsibility and the need for seriousness of intent in treating with issues of the blue economy. We heard from Ambassador Schmillen on the importance of making decisions based on appropriate data and the fact that we don't have sufficient data points to make the right decisions. We heard from Ambassador Guillaume Var that there's a lot of opportunity for energy uh, to be created from that space in a responsible way. And of course, we heard from Minister Samuda a number of things, but the primary thing in my mind was the idea that there needs to be thought leadership and no better place for the thought leadership to take place than a location such as this. And he also made the point that the potential for the, the blue economy optimization rests with all of us and we must also be responsible on land. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to open the floor for question and answer. We'll do it in the same way that we did it when we engaged Minister Bartlett. Simply raise your hand. And I'm sure you would want to engage these gentlemen in uh, q and I, I, I wanted to read for you some of the online comments because we're streaming live on YouTube. And there have been some very interesting comments. I wanted, well, one individual said, well, this goes back to the tourism presentation. He says, discouraged from tourism, not a problem. Broaden the definition of the industry. It is in need of support and contribution from every talent, environmentalists, mariners, scientists, engineers. And the person goes on to speak to the Sargassum issue, Ambassador, says, here we need a solution to Sargassum invasion, the key problem for the industry. 
scientists and engineers needed. Another call being made there. But uh, th there's also a question here which I think I, I'll allow anybody to answer it who chooses to. There's a question in, on YouTube which says, we have an invasion of sargassum. It's damaging our coastal tourism product. What plans are in place or should be in place to address this urgent problem and at its root, probably as a result of nutrient runoff. Ambassador Schmillen, do you want to take that one? Yeah. It's on? Yeah. Yeah, indeed, that is a, it's a problem, the invasion of uh, seaweed. Um, I attended an con international conference, I think, two years ago in Miami. There was a young gentleman from the Eastern Caribbean island, and he was a bio... Uh, biotechnologists, he studied biotechnology, and he invented um, some technique to use the sargassum seaweed as a fertilizer, fluid fertilizer. So he saw this potential and he invented it. He won the Blue Tech competition in this, uh, in this category. It was a very, very promising project. I don't know exactly what the, uh, the state of uh, at the moment, but you can see there, there's a lot of different ideas all over the world, especially also in the region, about how to deal with sargassum. So there is a book from the university in Martinique, I think it's roughly 200 pages big, with a lot of different ideas, fertilizer. Uh, we heard about energy, but you can also use uh, uh, or try to think about how you can m make use of uh, seaweed as part of uh, to produce uh, biomass, also uh, energy. What we proposed, or what we were thinking about when I mentioned MIT uh, and uh, the tourism enhancement funds was to go close to the beaches and to intercept it, not because the Targo is available to deal with the sargassum here in the whole Caribbean, but to show the world that we have an idea and that we can do something with our own means. So um, that I think is, is important, but there's a lot of different things, a, di a lot of good ideas and uh, what I like to have is that the tourist is sitting in the plane, opening the, the magazine, what you normally get, and there's an article about the CMU using this kind of interception technology and to deal with sargassum, sargassum seaweed. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And I quite like the, the CO2 sequestration approach, which sounds like it has a lot of potential. Thank you, Ambassador. We have a number of questions in the audience. Um, I see a hand, oh yes, uh, Ms. Geddes of the CMU has a question. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, this question is directed to Senator Matthew Samudo. Um, it's regarding water scarcity. Uh, it is not unique to Jamaica or the Caribbean at all. Um, and especially because of climate change, we're going to have ongoing water scarcity, all right? Now, the talks about desalination within the Caribbean, what are the plans for that regarding Jamaica? Thank you. Thank you. So, Jamaica has to approach its water sector in a, in a, mixed, in a mixed way. Kingston and St. Andrew will not have, in its current size, current population size and economic size, will not have a challenge in two years without desalination. We will start construction of the Rio Cobra water treatment plant, which has been spoken about for 15 years, within a matter of maybe a month, at most two months. They're in the final stages of their NEPA permits. That will pull 15 million gallons from the Rio Cobra and put it between Portmore and Kingston all the way out to Port Royal, which also has had a permanent drought for a very long time because of weak pipeline distribution. Um, that coupled with increased investment in reducing your non-revenue water, in basically reducing leaks and ensuring that you actually account for what you have will deal with Kingston and St. Andrew. That, however, doesn't deal with the critical issue you have in the south central part of the island, both as it relates to agricultural water, industrial water, and of course, residential use. We will have to um, supplement our water supply in that area with desalinated water. We are also likely to have to consider the same for sections of St. Thomas and yes, even for Portland because the cost of extraction is very high. So 
we will engage desalination. Last year in the Prime Minister's budget speech, he spoke to a proposal Jamaica had received for a massive solar-powered deep-sea desalination pumped hydro storage project. Very long name. We're going to have to find a, a cute description for it. But in essence, yes, it is the intention to engage modern desalination technology. A lot of what the Eastern Caribbean used was particularly dirty in its early onset. Much new technology has come since. So I believe it's now a, a reasonable consideration. It wasn't necessarily so 20 years ago. But the energy part of it is going to be critical because it's not cheap to desalinate. And at 42 cents a kilowatt hour, that's not going to work. So there has to be a renewable energy component to the project for it to be a, a, a real possibility. Uh, I see another hand on this side, yes. Sir, you want to identify yourself? Working? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicholas Spence, lecturer in the Faculty of Shipping and Logistics. Uh, I, this question is dedicated to Ambassador Olivier. Very informative presentation on renewable energy. Allow me to set some context really quickly. So, in our port of Kingston, yes, and home to the French shipping giant CMA, CGM, one of the main things that tend to happen when vessels come alongside, they have to connect to shore for power. And throughout your presentation, the theme was about renewable energy, right? sustainable energy. Now, can you prescribe any recommendations for developing countries to outline a more sustainable, renewable energy generation for ports and as you may not know, that, that is also a leading cost in port fees. And it would you know, offset that and become more attractive for shipping lines to come to, come to come to ports that have more flexible costing. So any recommendations for developing countries? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for your, for your comments and for your question. Um, I, I would not make any, any, any recommendation because I'm, I'm not really a specialist on that, but um, I know that you know, the, 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 the KFTL part of the port uh, is operated by a French company, uh, CMS CGM, and uh, recently, two months ago, the, the vice president of, K, of, of CMS CGM came to Jamaica because they want to make a new investment. Uh, to increase their operation in the port of Kingston. So what uh, Minister Samuna mentioned, that the location of, of Jamaica by itself is, is an asset. And, and so you, we, we can make the best use of this asset. So the CMS EGM is believes in Kingston as a regional hub in the Caribbean to serve and to be a tra tra uh, transit, play, transit place between China and the US through the Canal of Panama and between North America and South America. So in terms of servicing the, the, the vessels, we, we, we had this issue two weeks ago because we had a, a, a French Navy vessel port call and the, the, the ship was docked at KFTL also. And um, uh, there is the issue of servicing the, the electricity. And now um, there are new international regulation which uh, provides for interdiction of using the vessel uh, engine in the port to produce electricity. So the, the, the vessels have to be serviced uh, by sea. I know that KFTL now is thinking to put solar panels uh, on some surfaces of the, of the harbor to produce uh, electricity. Uh, you know that there is a big solar plant in Savannah Lamar, the Paradise Park uh, solar plant, which, which was designed by Newen, another French uh, company, and some French company have also project in, in, in Jamaica for solar plants. So this is one of the solution, uh, solar plants, and Jamaica is, by its location and by, by its climate, is blessed by nature in, ter in terms of solar energy. To my understanding, 70% of, of, of daytime can be used to produce uh, solar energy, and you see more and more private home, including in my embassy, I have a project to put solar panels uh, to, to develop this kind of energy. So it might be an avenue of development for Jamaica, solar energy beside um, marine renewable energies. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. Just to add to that discussion, the potential for revenue generation, Mr. Spence, 
there's now a move, very early stages, very embryonic, in Antigua to provide shore power at ports. And, and, and that move will require some kind of critical mass throughout the region. So we need to have some cooperation. Otherwise, it makes no sense for a small port in Antigua to do that while others are not supporting the effort. So I think those early talks will also look at the other side of it, treating with the costs by, uh, by you know, attacking it with, with revenue streams from that particular activity as well. I see uh, a hand, well, I see many hands. Um, can I see all the hands? And one has the microphone. Dr. Clayton has the microphone. And then I see... Commissioner Ellington with a hand raised, and I see Commander John McFarlane with a hand raised. So, okay, and there are two students on this side. So if we can, and then we have Mr. Kyle Mays, VP of the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association. I think those, unless I see other hands now, those will be our six comments or questions in that order, so those operating the microphones can handle accordingly. Over to you, Dr. Clayton. Thank you, Prof. Good morning. Good afternoon again, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. It has been a very interesting morning into afternoon so far. Um, this uh, is a statement and a question together. Uh, Senator Samuda, I like your use of words, you know, CMU thought leader. Um, there is the emphasis on um, our role as leading the Caribbean along in, in a more sustainable blue economy. Now, this week at the UN, they're facilitating the Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity. And that treaty is in jeopardy because of, um, it's expected to end this weekend. There needs to be some consensus by this weekend, and that is already in jeopardy because there is lack of consensus among the players. Um, we are talking today about a regional space, that is the ocean, but it currently suffers from what we call tragedy of the commons. And so my question is, my concern really is that the continuous focus on the economic value of the ocean, with some reference to the, the importance of maintaining its health, sees us continuously looking at this space using the triple bottom line approach. And there, there needs to be more of a, what we call the bullseye strategy, which incorporates everything else within the environment, a focus on protecting and preserving the integrity of the environment. Because as you rightfully said in your presentation, the economy cannot thrive without a, the, a healthy environment. So I'm taking it for granted that the resource conservation is being integrated in any development strategy that we have for the blue economy. My question therefore is, how is systems thinking and the sustainable development framework being integrated in that strategy for the region's blue economy? Thank you for that. Um, Jamaica is a member of what is called the High Ambition Coalition. The, the primary ambition in this coalition is to protect 30% of landmass 30% of your EEZ by 2030. Um, Jamaica was a member of that long before COP15 in Canada last year, which saw this become a global position. And we're well on the way. With the protection of the cockpit country, Jamaica moved to 25% of its landmass being protected and is likely to pass 2030, is likely to pass 30% of its terrestrial mass by 2025. So we will beat that target um, long ahead of that space. But we've also protected some important marine areas which brought us to about 14, 15%. They're still doing the complete spatial management in terms of what have we protected at sea and what we still have left to do. Last year we completed the protection of the Black River Marassa near shore area, a very sensitive ecosystem. We also completed the protection, something that people have spoken about for over 40 years, of the Pedro Keys and its banks. This shows the commitment to protecting our sensitive marine environment. If I had had the opportunity, and I know it's Prof Spencer's intent to bring speakers such as Henrik Sala from Pristine Seas, if I had, if I had, had the time, I'd have um, shown you a, a document that he did for me, which showed the three priorities in protection. Biodiversity, 
food production, and indeed um, carbon sequestration. And he did the study of our marine environment around Jamaica to say, well, where was the best areas for each of these to be realized? Our priority is where they intersect. So we're completing the legislative work that will protect all of the areas that in protection will ensure that you have increased food production, you have increased carbon sequestration, and indeed you protect more of your sensitive biodiversity. So that's, that's underway. But there's a, a point that's not, I think, widely understood, and it's a dangerous one to make politically, and I hope it's not misconstrued, is the fact that Minister Bartlett spoke about the need for us to conquer ignorance, the need for us to ensure that we have the adequate information. And where you have the largest information deficit is in the segment of the society that faces the greatest economic pressures. Let me frame it like that. So for instance, a lot is made about mangroves, critical to our ecosystems, critical to our coastal defenses. The largest area of mangrove degradation has no relation to hotels. It's in southern St. Catherine, all through southern Clarendon into the eastern end of southern Manchester. That's where you've had the greatest degradation of mangroves, where there's no accompanying economic value. So there's a danger in seeing areas and saying that you shouldn't earn from them. Because it's absolutely important to ensure that you reduce the economic pressures on your society so that it is easier to give them the information to make decisions that lean to sustainability. It's just, it, it's related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They can't consider long-term decisions when you have short-term needs that they're not able to, to meet. So I think there's also a danger in not allowing the economic decision, the economic discussion to be a part of the environmental discussion. Yep. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Commissioner Ellington. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much to the uh, presenters on the panel. I, I'd like to direct my question to Minister Samuda. Sir, in response to a question posed by Jamelia earlier on, you mentioned the soon-to-be-constructed Rio Cobre water system. And um, I, I just felt the urge to ask you if you are concerned about the preventable pollution of that river and how that project could trigger long-term public health situation if it's not mitigated. So uh, thank you very much for that question, Commissioner. The, the reality is also what happens in our rivers also impacts our, our oceans as the pollution runs out into our near shore environment. Jamaica hasn't treated its rivers very well, not least of all the, the Rio Cobra. We've been very careless with allowing development to take place with a proximity to, our, to many of our water sources. Rio Cobra is a primary example of bad decisions in many ways. We will, however, this year, take the legislative steps to ban all effluent discharge into the Rio Cobra and other rivers that are being deemed to be particularly sensitive. The risk to the Rio Cobra is to health, to the economy, to social stability. But it's not just a risk from bauxite. We've allowed long-term agri um, agricultural practices along that corridor which don't necessarily suit the health of the river. We've allowed um, some legal and some illegal housing developments to pop up along that space which aren't connected to proper sewage disposal. So there's a number of issues we will have to take on if we're to return the Rio Cobra to the health that we really want to see. So in answering your question, Commissioner, yes, we're absolutely concerned is a risk not just to human health and to individual health, but it's a risk to the stability of the society because it is a critical part of our water provision strategy. Thank you, Minister. Who, who is next with the microphone? All right, we have our student from the incubator. <laughs> from the incubator. Yes. Hi again, um, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Senator Samuda, I'm sorry, apparently you're in the hot seat. Um, 
So my, throughout the theme that I've been getting throughout this whole thing has been education and knowledge, right? And your, that ministry that you have has so much power regarding, you know, the key to that knowledge. Is there a strong relationship between that ministry and the ministry of education, specifically during the primary and high school levels? Because what I find is um, the gap of knowledge that we, us in this room have in contrast to, you know, kids is vast. And I really think that if it is that they do have that knowledge, that there can be some change, right? So I, I just want to know the relationship between your ministry and Ministry of Education, and, um, you know, is there, is there some effort there to, to grow it? Thank you. Thank you. So in an effort to ensure that the hot seat doesn't get hot up, just to clarify, it's the Prime Minister's ministry. I just provide support, all right? Um, but that aside, the, the relationship in government between ministries plays out primarily and firstly at the cabinet, where the Council of Ministers sit and they, they look at points for collaboration, points of conflict, and they try to resolve them um, through cabinet space. So the reality is all ministries are interlinked, interrelated. Then it comes down to the PS board meetings where all the permanent secretaries meet. They look at opportunities for collaboration, p possible points of friction, and they work it through. And it goes all the way down. Um, I'm not satisfied, admittedly, with the level of public education and socialization that the ministry is doing on issues of sustainability in primary and secondary schools. We do have programs. We just don't have enough programs, and the frequency and level of support that they require is not there, and we'll have to do quite a bit of work in that regard. Thank you. Over to Commander. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a couple of points. One, you spoke, Minister, about fishermen not swimming in our country. I think it was, it was yourself, I think, who said that. Yes. One experience which I had when I, in my capacity as um, Royal Life Saving, when you try to talk with fishermen, they give us one simple statement. Boss, you see when me out at sea, me can't swim back to land if the port capsized. Me might not learn to swim anyway. Genuinely, many of them tell me that. They will not learn to swim because it's a waste of time. But we try. Um, on the question so, of the deep water cooling, I'd like to, I, I, first of all, thank you very much for this session and for all the speakers and the scope that was covered. I really, really appreciate it and congratulations to you. On the question of the deep water cooling, we at the airports authority had planned to use it for our cooling system because our JPS bill was in double digit millions per month. No, so it really, that, and, and cooling was a major part of that. So we had looked at it, and it didn't really make a lot of sense for us. But in, in the context of region, of, 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 of a, a, a grouping, so for Kingston, for the hotels, for the Kingston, for the major facilities in Kingston, or the groupings in Otrius or Negril, or other areas, I think it would make sense, and I would encourage that there be a proactive approach to making it happen, bearing in mind that the consequence, the, the adverse as effect, effect of it will be reduced revenues for JPS. As to what, how that will affect us, I don't know. But I would encourage us, sir, to go ahead and make that deep water cooling a reality. It has been used in Toronto, I know, and was a part of greater Toronto metropolis many, many years ago. I'm not quite sure if it's still being used, but it is a very effective tool, and I would like to um, recommend that we use it. And the last thing is on the mangroves. Mangrove replacement is a reality, and is something which I think could also be encouraged. Sir. Thank you very much, Commander. Just a response from Minister. Just briefly, um, our fisher folk have never considered the other economic possibilities for them being citizens of the ocean, blue citizens, blue employees. Um, and that, I think, is at the core of the issue. Why they've never considered the importance of, of fishing. But as we continue to overfish, even though we're making efforts to stop it, 
There will be need for greater seasons implemented. There will be need for bans of particular things. And there will be need for greater protected spaces to ensure that our fish stock doesn't decline any further. Now, there's opportunities for them to earn being so comfortable at sea. Diving, massive opportunity and win when you protect spaces. The diving opportunity is enormous. Opportunities to work in the pleasure craft industry. Opportunities to provide support for mangrove replanting. All of these opportunities are there for them, and we need to ensure that they understand that this doesn't limit. It rather creates a new skill that creates new opportunities for them. Mangrove restoration and replanting is taking place. Several people doing it. Um, it is a reality. It's something that we're working on. There are private individuals doing it. There's academia doing it. There are some NGOs. Government will provide support to anyone who wants to pursue mangrove restoration. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we're now on to our very eloquent tourism student. Right here, do you have the microphone, sir? Yes, and then after him, Mr. Mace, and then... All right, so my question is for Ambassador Olivier. So um, your mere presence here in Jamaica means that there has been some conversation about how France can introduce its renewable energy um, resources or, you know, in Jamaica, how we can, you know, facilitate that relationship. So I want to know specifically what facilitating resources or what core resources have you been discussing to help develop environmental resilience in Jamaica in contribution to the blue economy? Um, we, we have some contribution, not, not directly in the blue economy, but for instance, I mentioned the, the, the solar farm uh, of uh, Savannah Lamar, of, of Paradise Park, which was designed by a French company, and there was a French loan by the French government uh, to build uh, this uh, the, 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 this farm. Uh, there is another company you now which is called Element, uh, who is looking for two locations in, in in Jamaica uh, to build two solar two new solar plants. Um, the project which we mentioned, Mr. Minister of uh, Rio Cobre, um, is also uh, going to be built by a French company, Vinci. Vinci with with. Sorry, uh, so Vinci also is contributing, and he's contributing not only in engineering, but he's contributing also in terms of, of course, service to the service to the Jamaican society, but to uh, jobs also. Because, for instance, Vinci, they have only two French, and all the, the, the other engineer, technical people, and so on, they're all from Jamaica. They use, use people from Jamaica. Um, basically, this is what we have done so far. Uh, of course, I would like to do to, to, to do more, and especially we see with 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 CMU. So we hope to to, to build something in uh, in that, and and renewable renewable energy can be also uh, part of this uh, project. Uh, just would like to make a comment. A lady mentioned the, the the issue of economy. I think that you protect well when you have an interest to protect. When you have an, and when you you can witness that in protecting, you can make more money. This is one of the key. And for instance, fishermen, they really know that it's more valuable to, to use, to make uh, sustainable fisheries than non-sustainable fisheries. Why? Because a fisherman he needs to invest, he needs to buy a boat, he needs to buy fuel and so on. So if you go fishing in the sea and after one year or two years there is no fish anymore, he's going to lose in his investment. So he needs, fishermen needs sustainable fishery to have predictability in terms of investment, in terms of revenue. And that's where economy and the economical approach of the protection of, of environment is very valuable. For instance, in the Seabed Authority, we are now discussing on, on the value of ecological service by the ocean. You know that the ocean is absorbing 80% per 80 of carbon. How do we value economically this phenomenon? It's, it's, it's very interesting. How do we value economically the um, uh, deep sea ecosystem and how we make the comparison, what we can get from mining the mineral of the deep sea compared to the destruction of some environment? Because when you do mining, you are going to destroy a part of the environment. And the, this destruction has to be sustainable. How do you value that? And it's very, very complicated. reason why you would protect nature and environment is 
is your heart, is love. And, it, and it's where we all, we all love our mother. We only have one mother. And this planet is our mother. We only have one planet. How education is key and recreation, recreation in nature. That's the of cooperation in sport between France and, and, and Jamaica. And in the field of cooperation, I added selling. Selling and kayaking. Why? Because while you sail, especially on small dinghy, you discover the sea. You start to love the sea. And when you love the sea, you want to protect the sea. When I do my kayaking trip in the mangrove here, I see that the mang there, there are a lot of plastics in the mangrove. If all the kids in Jamaica could have a kayak trip in the mangrove, see the plastic, they will think after when they throw a bottle from the window of the bus that this bottle is going to end up at the sea and is going to help. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Conversations, um, certainly, from um, my point of view, did, did get a lot of, a lot of um, golden nuggets today that we're going to work on. So just on behalf of uh, the GHTA and uh, by extension the CHTA Regional uh, Hotel Associations, uh, it's, it's more of an affirmation, gentlemen and, and ladies and gentlemen, that, that um, our organizations and by extension our members are, are fully committed to the preservation of um, our environment and to ensure that the sustainability of, of our industry as we move forward. We, we know very well the economic implications and, and effects that um, could have um, devastating uh, effects, events that come along. Um, and so we're, we're very conscious of, of, of um, our role as well as an industry and are doing, I think, a very good job in, in the, um, it towards the, the protection, preservation, when there's development. I, I just get, I'm very encouraged these days because there's so much more conversation uh, between ourselves, hotels, attractions, regions uh, in, in Jamaica, and, and then the, the, by extension, the Caribbean. And so a lot of what we've been talking about today, um, very much on our minds. And, um, and then the, the associations by virtue are doing as much. We, we're, we're doing a lot of great things. We can do more, I think, and that's, and that's, uh, that's on me um, and, and my role to, to educate more, to share more best practices when it comes to certain aspects of whether it is reef preservation and, and uh, the marine, uh, the biodiversity preservation, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I too could go on for a long time. We don't have a long time today, um, but I, I just wanted to, to share that with you. One thing when, when we, again, there were a couple, couple, lot of points that I would love to discuss, but um, the first one um, was about the, I think it was a online, a question uh, regarding sargassum. And so it struck me at that point in time to, to make a point that sometimes the effects that are being experienced by the region and, and, and the, you know, the effects on the environment and the, and the emissions by the larger, um, larger countries around the world 
And in the, in the case of sargassum, by the way, most of you know that sargassum is no longer really sargassum. It actually comes from the, the runoff of, um, of the Amazon. So, for ex so we're, we're talking about a nation now, by their practices, are creating a, a situation, environmental situation that is creating the blossoming of the sea, of this basically the seaweed. It's no longer, we call it sargassum because it used to come from the sargassum sea. Anyway, so my charge to, to you gentlemen, um, Senator, um, and our leaders, ambassadors, is, is how do we put, how do we put pressure on these, um, on these countries, more pressure, more, more um, you know, gov from, a, from, our, um, from a government perspective um, and, uh, you know, policy and, and uh, how, how, do we, how do we do more so that we are not affected by these external, um, by what is, what's happening in other countries, basically, in, 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 that, re in that regard, for example, with, the, with that example I just gave. Thank you very much, Mr. Mays. That sounds like part two of the Port Royal Lecture Series. Uh, but yeah, we appreciate the thoughts, certainly. Um, Ms. Morrison, you have a quick one for us, and then I have one wrap-up question to conclude. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So I have recognized that I've not heard anything about how to control our sewage system that is affecting our water. And I think it is so important that we address this issue. I'm not sure if you'll be able to give me a lengthy answer, but what is in the pipeline to address the sewage system in Jamaica because it affects our sea and its ecosystem and the environment? Please, thanks. All right, so to Kyle's earlier question is why Jamaica puts so much investment relative to its size and its um, bilateral relationships through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's why Jamaica is a member of the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, High, high Ambition Coalition. It's why we're so active at the UN. It's why, you know, it's why I go to the o our Ocean Conference tomorrow. It's to ensure that our voices are are heard. It's why we're members of SIDSDOC. It's why we have negotiating blocks with other um, developing nations to ensure that our issues are contemplated. Does it happen very often? Not quite in the way that we would like, but there are some glimmers of hope, certainly with the establishment of things like a loss and damage fund for climate change, etc. There are glimmers of hope and we could go on and on, but uh, you know, time is limited. To the other question, re-sewage. Sewage, is, sewage management is arguably the biggest environmental problem in Jamaica. And it requires billions of dollars to, to, to solve and to fix. The, the first thing we're doing is that there is a transaction which was announced, rather a project which was announced for the privatization and expansion of Soapberry. Soapberry deals with 18% of the sewage in Kingston and St. Andrew. KPMG, I believe, is a transaction manager in that case, and they're building the transaction which will see the privatization, possibly, of the system, and that will come with a doubling of capacity. So it should go between 36 and about 40% of Kingston being able to put its sewage in there. Anyone who studies mar marine biology will tell you that even with the 18%, you can already tell the improvement in the water quality pre and post soak berry. So as bad as it is, no, it was worse. Now, not, not that should be any comfort, but that's, that's the reality. It's going to require billions of dollars of investment. We're doing the planning work. We're obviously looking at where there's fiscal space to put in the money. There will be some significant investment or some increased investment, certainly in downtown's sewage capacity, which is one of the worst areas affected in, in the corporate area. But we're also looking very closely at places like Bernard Lodge, places like downtown Montego Bay, places like Negril, which have also been badly affected by weak sewage management. But the answer is, uh, is two words, it's billions of, well, three words, billions of dollars. It's not an issue of technical understanding, it's not an issue of knowing what's required, it's about building the partnerships with companies like Vinci that we do have to ensure that we're able to mobilize those billions faster because we are way behind the eight ball in that respect. Thank you very much, Minister. I have 
One concluding question, and I still have to ask it, just because, but I'm going to ask that everyone be extremely brief on this. There's a critical path to creating this blue society that we've all been talking about. We know CMU is a part of that, the Fisher Folk are a part of that. Multiple uh, groupings will be a part of that. What do you see as the most crucial, immediate step in creating a potent blue society, starting with Ambassador Schmiller, and we come right across. Uh, from my point of view, that you use what you have, like, for example, Center for Blue Economy, and uh, to focus and, and to, to concentrate all the, the different discussions, what is important for this island and the region. That's the short answer. Yeah, Ambassador. Ambassador Guillaume. I would say first would be education and research, and then involve especially the private sector in the, in the blue economy. And the blue economy is going to be a very innovative uh, economy. So it's, it needs seed money from government for research as first time when these developing these technology are not uh, profitable. And then when they have gone into the private sector, create the, the legislative uh, framework and, and for, for, for them to develop. So Prof. Culture eats strategy for breakfast every day of the week. So we're going to have to invest in building a blue culture. And you have to start at primary schools. You have to create the appreciation for your marine environment. Have to get them interested in, in understanding this asset and how it plays a role in their lives. And I think with that, everything else will fall into place. Thank you, Minister. Culture eats strategy for breakfast every day, provided your strategy your strategy is not to build great culture. <laughs> All right, so, so ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I really want to thank our speakers today. First and foremost, I want to spend the time to thank the production team. I want to thank Archibald Gordon and his team. I want to thank my core team, Abigail Ellis, Seradine Prince, Angelique Curtis Johns, everyone who's been involved in making this happen. Thanks to the students who stuck it out. Thanks to all of our stakeholders who stayed with us until the end. We're happy to have you. We know that the CMU is going to be the most critical cog in this wheel of making sure that the blue economy is not only resonant, but is impact in our region. So thank you, and we ask that you be the ambassadors that we expect you to be. God bless.